Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this October 21st, 2020 Hampton School Board meeting. I'd like to welcome all the folks who are on the Zoom meeting with us tonight, as well as anyone who is watching on PEG TV Live. Uh, I call this meeting to order. Ms. Bowers, would you be, please call the roll? Ms. Afanja? Here. Ms. Banks Gray? Here. Ms. Cherry? Here. Dr. Mason? Here. Mr. Samuels? Present. Dr. Woodhouse? Here. Mr. Kilgore? Here. Let the record show that all board members are present. I now move to the section where we are uh, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for this evening. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. I have a motion from Ms. Cherry. And who was my second? Woodhouse. Dr. Woodhouse. A motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Ms. Afonja. Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Ms. Cherry? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Mr. Samuels? Let the record show that all board members are present. Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Motion carries. I am now very excited to move to <clears throat> two of our meeting recognitions, and I will turn it over to Ms. Goral. Ms. Goral? I apologize, I forgot to unmute my video before I started the slide presentation. So I had to back out quickly. Okay, there we go. Well, good evening, Chairman Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, members of the school board, Superintendent Smith and our Hampton Schools family. As you are aware, we have been unable to have in-person recognition since last spring, regardless of last spring's shutdown and the beginning of this year in an all virtual learning model. We have several students, staff members, schools, a community member and school board members who have continued to push forward and accomplish great things. With that being said, it is my honor to recognize these individuals this evening for their accomplishments and awards. So our first recognition this evening is Janelle Saunders. Janelle is currently a senior at Bethel High School. Last spring during her junior year, she earned the Virginia High School League VHSL Class 5 State Championship in the girls 55 meter hurdles with a time of 8.16 seconds at their state indoor meet at the Boo Williams Sportsplex here in Hampton on February 28th and 29th. Her coaches were Nanette Gaines and John Vivens. Also looking back to last spring, we have Jordan Hardy, currently also a senior, but the, a senior at Hampton High School. And in her junior year, Jordan won the VHSL Class 4 State Championship in the long jump with an impressive jump of 18 feet, 2.75 inches, and the tri triple jump with a distance of 39 feet, 10.75 inches. The state meet was held at Liberty University in Lynchburg on March 2nd and 3rd. Hardy was coached by Ron Baton and Gloria Freeman. And both of these student athletes, and that would be Janelle as well as Jordan, will be receiving a certificate from the school board. Next, we have Samuel Chenkin, who is presently a senior at Phoebus High School. Last spring, Samuel earned a placement in the Virginia Band and Orchestra Directors Association District 8, as well as the Virginia All-State Concert Band. And this is the highest honor a student musician can earn in Virginia. Samuel plays the upright bat, uh, bass, the sousaphone, and he has also been a member of the concert band and marching band since his freshman year. And Matthew Caldwell is his band director. And also looking at the arts, we have Ashley Parks. Ashley's actually a graduate of Kikachan High School. So in the spring of her senior year, she had her artistic creation, which is pictured here, a woodcut printed on paper, selected by Congresswoman Elaine Luria in the state's Congressional Art Contest. 
The United States Congressional Art Contest is an event sponsored each spring by the Congressional Institute. It's a nationwide high school arts, visual arts competition to recognize and encourage artistic talent in the nation and each congressional district. So Ashley's piece is currently displayed in the Congresswoman's Peninsula office and Madeline Brewer was Park's art teacher. So both Samuel and Ashley will be receiving certificates from the school board. Our next slide here shows our Hampton Lady Crabbers. The Hampton High School girls basketball team under the direction of coach Shonda Bailey had a stellar season last year. They advanced to the state tournament by winning the region 4A championship. They defeated Hanover High School 58 to 31 in the state quarterfinals and then advanced to the state semifinals where they defeated Loudoun Valley High School 54, 59 to 54. And they earned a spot in the state championship game. But as you can all recall at that time, the Virginia High School League canceled the remaining state finals after the governor declared a state of emergency. So since the game could not be played, Hampton was recognized as the class four girls basketball co-champion. I would like to share that the team completed their season with a record of 26 and one. So I can confidently say that I feel if they were going forward, they would have been 27 and one if that tournament had not been canceled. But congratulations to our Lady Crabbers. The team will be receiving a banner to hang in their school. Moving on to staff recognitions. We have the Department of Innovation and Professional Learning. This outstanding department under the direction of Kate Wolf Maxlow, who is their director, received the Technology Leadership Award for 2019-2020. So to receive this recognition, the recipient or the recipients must integrate technology into their classroom or work environment and demonstrate an impact on student learning as well as improved effectiveness. The department and or individual must also exhibit the best teamwork, leadership, creativity, and innovative, innovative spirit to make big things happen with technology. Well, this department is certainly deserving of this award as they pack a powerful punch with a small group of people. Their work is organizing and delivering online-based instruction and professional development for teachers across the division, which has enabled us to deliver instruction in unprecedented times. They have created numerous delivery methods for service and support such as Google Classroom-based professional development, the virtual help desk, which actually provides live video streaming in-person support with the click of a button, the cyber learning cafe for self-paced professional development, an online lesson library, out-of-the-box le out lessons, which are pre-made, ready-to-use SOL-based activities, classroom support, and with all of that happening, they also managed to produce the Can't Tech This webcast and so much more. This team brings a friendly and creative solutions approach to every task and has made online instruction of, for our students a possibility, not just by the possibility, but it's practical. And as you can see from this slide, the department received an engraved acrylic award, which is currently being displayed in their office at, here at the School Administration Center. Next, we would like to recognize Dr. Vivian Greasy, our visual and performing arts curriculum leader, Kelly D, our teacher specialist for music, and all of our phenomenal music teachers. Because of their hard work and dedication, the Hampton City Schools Visual and Performing Arts Department has been recognized for the seventh time, yes, I said seven, by the NAM Foundation as a Best Communities for Music Education. Now in its 21st year, the Best Communities for Music Education designation is awarded to districts that demonstrate outstanding achievement and efforts to provide music, access, and education to all students. This award recognizes that Hampton City Schools is leading the way with learning opportunities as outlined in the Every Student Succeeds Act, which recognizes that music and the arts are important elements of a well-rounded education for all children. This department will also be receiving a certificate from the school board. In June, so we've got past spring now, in June, the State Board of Education recognized Hampton City Schools as one of only one of six school divisions in the entire Commonwealth for earning the 2020 Innovative Practice Award. This is the first year the board has issued the award, which acknowledges individual schools and school divisions for innovations implemented over the course of two academic years that improve student outcomes while providing data that demonstrates that the practice is meeting its objectives and is having a significant impact on outcomes for the targeted student population. 
So our division, Hampton City Schools, earned this prestigious award for the division's innovative practices to develop life-ready students through the implementation of the profile of a Virginia graduate and the five C's, skills and critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and citizenship. Those five C's are implemented throughout our curriculum, our social emotional learning, and real life performance assessments. The Hampton City Schools portrait of a Hampton graduate also supports the five C's, as this portrait captures the core values the school division strives to instill in each student. It defines the division's mission in terms of student outcomes, and it describes attributes that all Hampton City Schools graduates will possess in order to be successful in whatever they choose to pursue. Through transforming teaching and learning, Hampton City Schools is developing life-ready students. And by integrating career learning in K-12 schools and extended enrichment learning experiences, Hampton City Schools College and Career Readiness Plan ensures that our young people graduate ready for post-secondary pursuits and the workforce. And in addition to this prestige award, we have nine Hampton schools who earned the Board of Education Continuous Improvement Award and two Hampton City Schools who earned the Board of Education's Highest Achievement Award. So let's look at the 2020 Board of Education Continuous Improvement Award. So the nine schools that received this honor, here we have Bethel High School is our first school, Eaton Fundamental Middle School, Next, we have Kraft Elementary School and Lindsay Middle School. Machen Elementary School. Phoenix Pre-K through eight school. Smith Elementary School. Tarrant Middle School, and Tyler Elementary School. So these nine schools were out of 375 schools in the Commonwealth who have been recognized for earning the 2020 Board of Education Continuous Improvement Award. And schools were recognized for continuous improvement. They were rated accredited or accredited with conditions for the 2019-2020 school year and met at least one of four criteria based on performances from our 2018-2019 school year. So a huge congratulations to the students and staff of these nine schools for all of their hard work. And each school will be receiving a banner to hang in their buildings. So now let's look at the 2020 Board of Education Highest Achievement Award. The two schools that earned this accomplishment are Armstrong School for the Arts, <coughs> excuse me, and Tucker Caps Elementary School. These two schools were out of 71 schools in the Commonwealth that earned the highest achievement award. Schools recognized for the highest achievement award were accredited during the 1920 school year based on performance data from 2018, 2019. And they demonstrated high levels of success. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, that's a lot of a talking. <laughs> uh, take a quick drink. <coughs> I apologize. <clears throat> we demonstrated high levels of success across all school quality indicators. <clears throat> <clears throat> including success in narrowing achievement gaps. Schools also had to meet the level one accreditation benchmark for reading, mathematics, and science based on the student pass rate, not including growth or progress on assessments taken by English language learners. <clears throat> schools must also have had no more than a 5% achievement gap for schools with two student groups or a 10% gap for schools with three or more student groups between the lowest performing group and all other students in the school. In addition, schools must have achieved at least level one on all school quality indicators. So congratulations to the students and staff at Armstrong and Tucker, Tucker Caps. They will be each receiving a banner to hang in their buildings. So back to the spring, um, as you all remember, the school board approved a resolution to recognize Mark Crump of State Farm for the 2020 Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll. And I believe this was right before, <coughs> before our, um, our last March board meeting. 
So local businesses, large and small, corporate owned or family run, play a key role in supporting our communities and local schools. They have the power to shape community attitudes about public schools. The VSBA Business Honor Roll is a way for local school divisions to recognize local businesses for their support and to say thank you for their vital contributions, especially at schools facing increasing budget uncertainty. Mr. Crump is being honored for his ongoing support to Hampton Community Public Schools through the collection of school supplies. He has sponsored the Stuff the Bus event for the last four years, which in turn has supported hundreds of our students. We would like to extend a huge thank you to Mark Crump for his investment in our young people. And along with this recognition, Mr. Crump will be receiving a certificate from the Virginia School Boards Association. And at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Kilgore. Thank you very much, Ms. Goral. Um, I just wanna say, as you can see, we continue to have amazing students and staff and amazing accomplishments in Hampton City School. And so on behalf of the entire board, we want to congratulate all those recognized this evening. We wish, could be, we, wish we could be present um, to give you these certificates in person, but know that we're extremely proud of you and we appreciate all of your accomplishments and how you positively represent Hampton City Schools. So thank you and congratulations once again. So Ms. Goral, I will turn it back over to you. All right, hopefully I can quit coughing for you. Okay. Give me one moment. All right. So to wrap up our presentation this evening, each year the superintendent, as well as our school board members can earn academy credits through participation in the Virginia School Boards Association meetings and other academy sessions, as well as through VSBA governance and service activities. Awards are based on credits earned and range from a certificate of recognition to the highest honor of an award of distinction. So the first award that I would like to acknowledge is the award of excellence. The award of excellence is given to board members and superintendents superintendents who earn 48 credits in two years. So to begin with, our superintendent, Dr. Jeffrey Smith, has earned the Award of Excellence. Also, board member Miss Ann Cherry has earned the VSBA Award of Excellence, as well as Dr. Richard Mason, who has earned the VSBA Award of Excellence. Mr. Jason Samuels has also earned the VSBA Award of Excellence. And our Vice Chair, Dr. Reginald Woodhouse, has also earned the VSBA Award of Excellence. Each of these individuals will receive a silver VSBA pin. The highest honor is an award of distinction for earning 84 credits in two years. This award goes to our Chairman, Mr. Joseph Kilgore. Mr. Kilgore will receive a VSBA starfish pin for this honor. So congratulations to these board members as well as our superintendent for these wonderful acknowledgements. And Chair Kilgore, that concludes our recognitions for this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Goral. And congratulations to my uh, fellow board members and Dr. Smith uh, for their uh, silver VSBA pins. That is, uh, quite an accomplishment. So thank you very much for your commitment. We now move on to the consent agenda, section three of our meeting. And on our consent agenda this evening, we only have one item. It is personnel report number 20-15. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Uh -huh. Second. 
So who was my motion? It was it Ms. Jackson Afonja? Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And a second by Ms. Banks Gray. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Bowers, would you call for the vote? Ms. Banks Gray. Aye. Ms. Cherry. Aye. Dr. Mason. Aye. Mr. Samuels. Aye. Dr. Woodhouse. Aye. Ms. Afonja. Aye. Mr. Kilgore. Aye. Motion carries. Our next section of the agenda is the superintendent and staff reports, and I will turn it over to Dr. Smith at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the school board. It is my pleasure to um, start this particular presentation, then do a handoff to um, uh, Dr. Caggiano, who serves as our deputy superintendent for curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, so this evening, we'll provide information and an update relative to the modified in-person return to learning uh, in general. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, the agenda for this particular presentation certainly will um, talk about the considerations for a modified return to in-person learning. Also, um, critical steps taken in preparation uh, for modified in-person learning and then enhancements to uh, the return to school plan that we have made. And then certainly Dr. Uh, Kajano will uh, talk about the professional development opportunities um, going forward um, as well. The next slide, please. So when we uh, look at the considerations for a modified uh, uh, in-person return, um, you know, the critical steps taken in preparation for it um, certainly are around the fact of what we shared with the board on, on October the 7th in particular, as it relates to the necessary uh, protocols and the purchase of specific PPE. And so you'll recall uh, at the October 7th board uh, meeting, uh, we shared uh, in greater detail, certainly those critical steps taken to date where we've secured the necessary uh, personal protective equipment, developed the mitigation strategies uh, to include the sick or care rooms independent of the school clinics, um, and then created protocols and expectations to facilitate healthy and safe schools uh, and work sites um, as well. Uh, train all of the school nurses on contact tracing protocols, develop the modified in-person school level schedules, um, and then survey families regarding modified return to school learning uh, preference and uh, reopen the modified return to school learning preference survey for families uh, to change their specific preference if they desire to, to do so. And then we surveyed staff twice uh, regarding their ability to return to the work site and um, provided a follow-up survey for staff who indicated that childcare uh, might be a concern. Uh, in addition to those particular steps, uh, we conducted an operational capacity analysis that we shared with the board um, in great detail, um, as well as bus riding protocols, um, and then provided uh, our transportation department under the leadership of Mr. Darren Wills uh, with the data that we received from um, our families regarding uh, the preference that was indicated, whether that would be to remain 100% uh, virtual um, for the second nine weeks or uh, to return to a modified in-person learning setting. Um, and then of course we collaborated with the food nutrition services uh, to ensure that we would have um, the appropriate plan in place uh, to address how we would uh, serve breakfast as, as well as lunch. And then um, the involvement of members of the division leadership team uh, along with um, the various departments that are supervised by individuals and members of the division leadership team and certainly at the school level uh, to look and to examine schedules and to develop specific schedules. And so uh, members of the division leadership team really, um, I think at the last board meeting provided a deeper dive, um, but that's just an overview of um, considerations for a modified in-person return and uh, the critical steps taken in preparation uh, to date. Um, you'll recall that uh, as a part of the considerations for a modified in-person return that 51% of the family survey um, indicated a desire 
to return to in-person learning. And again, if you look at the in-person learning and the virtual learning, uh, you get a chance to see and we're able to see um, at each level um, how families uh, responded uh, in terms of the, um, their individual or the individual preference of, of, of a particular family. Um, and also, um, you know, when we when we look at our 100% virtual model, as well as the uh, modified uh, in person learning model, uh, we have been governed by um, our mission statement. And one of the things that we have shared with the staff uh, on a regular basis, and that is, while we're dealing with the pandemic, uh, and COVID-19, certainly in particular, that our mission um, certainly remains the same. And that is to really we want to make certain that we ensure academic excellence for every child, every day, whatever it takes. And so whether 100% virtual or the modified in-person learning model, uh, we have set before us the mission to ensure that um, with the 100% uh, virtual model, that uh, we really uh, have the opportunity to peel the layers back to make certain that we had a very robust program and, uh, and it's still up and running. But likewise, with the modified uh, in-person learning model, uh, that same energy uh, as it relates to mitigation strategies, what protocols, procedures, um, and systems that we would need in place in order to move forward with a modified in-person learning model. So again, our mission uh, served as, as the backdrop. Next slide. I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Kajano at this time. All right, thank you, Dr. Smith. Good evening, Chairman Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, members of the board. As Dr. Smith mentioned, when we looked at the survey results in approximately 50% in-person, as far as family preference, 50% virtual, there, uh, we've also heard from staff in reference to that while the virtual setting is certainly meeting a number of students' needs, there are students whose needs are not being met. And uh, as this uh, quote here, as this research speaks to the importance of early literacy and literacy development. So uh, we are hearing not only from, from parents, but from staff as well, administrators, teachers, in reference to that while virtual learning is working for a number of our students uh, in order to close some gaps, uh, we're hearing some requests for in-person learning as, as well. So that is one of the considerations. Another consideration, when you look at the research associated with transitional years and years where students are, are transitioning to a new school or to a new grade level. For example, we shared with the board during the uh, previous board meeting that our plan would entail a staged reentry of students. And so the vulnerable student group populations, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And of course, primary students, grades pre-K through three, and then also when you look at the research again associated with students transitioning to a new school, a middle school, for example, grade six or high school, grade nine, that the opportunity for those students get acclimated without a larger group of, of, of students around, which this pandemic would provide, uh, would be an ideal situation. And so uh, the thinking is in that first stage to bring back sixth graders as well, as well for that very reason. Now you'll recall during the last presentation, we had ninth graders in stage one. And after receiving some feedback from both high school administrators and high school teachers, and with the additional technology, we'll mention that enhancement tonight, with the additional technology to support the high school instructional model in a hybrid model, uh, we wanted some additional time for training. So we've got November 6th set aside that Friday as some virtual training for all high school teachers. And I'll speak to that a little bit more lately, uh, later on in the presentation. So stage one and then stage two and stage three. And as we shared with the board last week, uh, we're not looking to set a timeline regarding the difference uh, when stage two would come after stage one and, and stage three, et cetera. But th this is another uh, consideration again for modified in-person learning. Operational capacity, Dr. Smith alluded to the staff survey we administered. It really was a one question survey. I know the board is aware of this survey and the results and our, uh, our staff members are as well. The data from this survey here informed uh, our decision-making around operational capacity. So we did share this chart with the board last week. So just to recap, for example, the results of that survey factoring into this data you see here, if we use elementary schools for an example, 
88% of the of teachers who responded said that they are in a position to work on site. Uh, those who submitted medical documentation and were approved to teach virtually from home, but remain engaged with students, you see there 8.21%. So adding those together, approximately 97% of our elementary faculty are in a position to engage with students. And then we have a small percentage here, less than 1%. They've been approved, for example, for FMLA. And then we have another small percentage of current vacancies at the elementary level. So again, uh, as far as a consideration for return to a hybrid approach, modified in-person learning for some students, uh, operational capacity does exist. Another consideration, as you all are well aware, would be the division health metrics. We shared this particular information with the board during our last meeting that as of September 25th, the Virginia Department of Health does recommend that we use the CDC indicators for dynamic school decision making. So for those viewing at home and who have a copy of this presentation or downloaded one, you're able to click on this link here that will take you directly to that framework. And then we also have some links here at the bottom, both directly to the Virginia Department of Health School Metrics website where you can uh, use a pull down menu to select different localities. And then we have, of course, we update this, our team, we have a team that meets on a weekly basis on Wednesdays with our uh, Virginia Department of Health representatives. And we update our Hampton City Schools website as well. So at this time, in reference to today's updated numbers, I'll uh, turn it over to Ms. Gill, Nurse Gill, who will share where we stand as of October 21st. Nurse Gill. Thank you, sir. Um, as of today, uh, or yeah, today, sorry, total number of new cases per 100,000 persons is at 122.8, which puts us at a higher risk. And then the percentage of positive tests during the last 14 days is at 5.1%, which is at moderate, moderate risk. And from the board's presentation last week, this is an increase. But I, I do, I do want to say, um, just from a nursing standpoint or a medical standpoint, with all viruses, there is that up and down tick. You're gonna have air time periods that we're going to be high and then we're gonna have periods where we're gonna be low. And if you look at the whole scheme of the graphs that we have on, on sites that we ha you can check, um, it certainly is a, a flowing kind of thing. Um, right now we are a little bit on an uptick, but uh, I do hope that that continues to start going back down. The ability of our school to implement those five key mitigation strategies, which is on one of the sites. Um, at present, we are at uh, low to lowest risk. I think that uh, I would like to say that we have gone um, extremely uh, beyond what seems like most districts are doing, uh, where we're making those mitigation plans to ensure a, a, a very good environment for our students to return to both in cleaning but also in communications and education on what to be done as well as the nursing staff are prepared for contact tracing and and we've been doing that since uh, mid-march maybe a little bit later on exactly with our employees so we're, we're quite gifted or quite trained i should say in doing that information and i'll turn that back over to dr Kajiano. Thank you, Nurse Gill. Of course, as the CDC recommends, the goal is to offset any potential risk. And that's why we do, as Dr. Smith mentioned, have strong protocols and mitigation strategies in place. You'll recall during the last board meeting, we shared with the board that we would be putting in place uh, select written protocols and expectations. And we have developed those for a modified return to in-person learning. You'll see those there. An update since our last meeting is that stakeholders, internal and external, these are now live on our website and YouTube. So thanks to uh, Ms. Gorrell, her department, as well as Channel 46 and working with our staff collectively to uh, create these resources. So first off, if I were to click on this link here, it would take us to the Division's Return to School website. You would see these one pagers for each of these uh, protocol and expectation documents here. And then we've also created the, the videos working through Channel 46. So all of these here, if I were to click on this link, it would take me to YouTube and that YouTube link would pull up uh, on the side, I would see all of those videos. And so I do have one highlighted. We wanted to share one with you this evening, uh, the bus rider expectations video. So I'll go ahead to YouTube here. Students will be transported to and from school. If a parent or guardian selected the need for transportation on the return to school preference survey, out-of-zone students still need to be transported to and from school by the parent or guardian. 
the front seat on each side of the bus will remain open. Students may be assigned to a specific seat. Students will sit one per seat next to the window. Students who live in the same household will be allowed to sit together up to a maximum of two students per seat. Due to space constraints, all students will be required to wear a face covering at all times while riding the school bus. Parents or guardians of English language learners, students with disabilities, and pre-K students will be notified by their bus driver of their child's stop time and route number. This information will also be available on the Hampton City Schools website. Drivers in attendance will be cleaning high-touch areas at the completion of each route. Additionally, buses will be thoroughly disinfected after all routes are completed each morning and evening. School Board Policy EEAA will continue to be enforced, which requires bus tags for pre-K and kindergarten students. So again, Channel 46 and Ms. Gorl's office have done an excellent job working with our staff to create those videos. And we certainly would encourage families to view them and uh, students to, to, to view them uh, with, with their parents as well. Other enhancements, uh, as you all know, you have been engaged with uh, Dr. Smith over the last couple of weeks. And so in conversations that I know he has had with you all, uh, there's some additional enhancements since we had the opportunity to last year our plan with the board. So for example, uh, one of the recommendations was that in between class changes perhaps, are there opportunities, particularly in our secondary schools, for uh, mitigation strategies in the hallways. And so uh, Dr. Bowling, working with Dr. Smith, uh, we have purchased electrostatic uh, sprayers for the school hallways. So that is an enhancement since our last meeting. This was one that uh, yesterday when we met with a number of our teachers virtually, uh, that was very well received. Also the purchase of additional air purifiers for each classroom. So these are Allen air purifiers. They're a, a medical grade HEPA uh, H13 filters, and they filter out 99.9% .9 of airborne contaminants. So we have 2000 of those slated to be delivered next week. Again, uh, one per every classroom in Hampton City Schools. Additionally, we felt it was important both for staff and students. Here you see the student and parent guardian HCS expectations agreement. For example, over the last several weeks, some questions from uh, uh, teachers and administrators regarding such as what if a student refuses to wear a mask? And so uh, the expectation will be that prior to students returning to school, that they will go on to parent portal, just like they did in, via the survey to make their selection for the survey in person or virtual. They would go back on the parent portal. They would have an opportunity, click on the link, read that agreement and sign off on the, the agreement. For those boys and girls, if there is an issue, for those students and families, if, if there is an issue with Parent Portal, we will have hard copies available at school. The expectation would be within a day or two, uh, the parent to uh, review that agreement with the child. They sign off and bring that back to school. The school secretary would go in to Parent Portal and go ahead and click the yes that we do have documentation for that agreement. Same uh, along the lines of staff. And so uh, those have uh, been drafted this week. Also, another enhancement, random temperature checks. One of the things we will be doing in the clinic, regardless of uh, which student reports to the clinic, they'll automatically receive a temperature check. And as you can imagine, in an in-person setting uh, such where we are, at sometimes a, a student may complain of, of, of a higher uh, temperature or they're feeling warm. In that case, if a teacher communicates with a nurse, the nurse can count, come down and rather single out that one student, really random temperature check the entire classroom in that case. So, and so that is an enhancement we've added. And then we've been doing some research really for quite some time, but this week we've whittled it down. We've been working over the last couple of weeks with high school teachers, with curriculum leaders and teacher specialists to say in that high school model, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, where I would have as a classroom teacher in-person learners, I would also be engaging at that same time with virtual learners. What is the best technology to facilitate effective practices in that setting. And so we've narrowed it down now to just a couple of web webcams and then uh, just a couple of high fidelity headsets too. We're just about ready to press send on that order and expect a delivery of next week there for each of our 400 high school classrooms. So we'd like to thank the board members for their feedback with, uh, with in reference to uh, those particular enhancements. Another enhancement as you know, June 30th was the last time we updated phase two, phase three, phase four of our return to school website. And so as of four o'clock yesterday, 
we have uh, ad again updated the website. And so now I am on the div division's uh, return to school website. I go to the top of the page here. And if I were to click on phase two, phase two has been updated. So there's some language at the top. You'll see the stage return we walk through. And then what I'd like to call viewers attention to primarily these four buttons here. And so if I have some questions in reference to elementary in phase two, uh, what does that look like? Everything from transportation, the cafeteria, bus protocols. Can I switch from in-person to virtual learning? So all I have to do is click on this. And there are lots of questions here for families that are organized and the general information is the first topic. So lots of questions here. I simply click on this again to collapse it. We have similar questions here, FAQs at the secondary level. And then for parents, we have detailed schedules, very detailed schedules by grade level at the elementary level and then at the secondary level. So for the elementary level, I click here. I have some information, some text here, and then I can simply click on the tab of the grade level and then scroll down. And it would be the same thing for the secondary level here, clicking on that tab. Now, because this is on the website and I'm sharing the screen via Zoom, I'm going to actually pull up at this time the Google Doc that houses uh, these schedules just so you have a bit of a clearer view of them. So as you recall, again, two weeks ago, we shared with the board, these were the minutes we were projecting for schedules. Uh, those came to us through, for example, at the elementary level, Dr. Haynes, I'm sorry, Dr. Owens, uh, building principals, assistant principals feedback, Dr. Haynes and principals APs at the secondary level feedback. They gave those schedules then to the curriculum instruction assessment department. They did their thing and uh, put some suggested times on there for different content areas, et cetera, gave it back to building administrators with some teacher oversight as well. And now uh, where we've landed with the schedules posted to the website. So uh, I know there was a question from uh, Mr. Samuels asked a question this week in reference to planning time at the elementary level, wanting to ensure that we do have planning time. And as the board knows, with our policy the expectation at the elementary level of a minimum of 30 minutes per day. We have that uh, for all of our teachers, 30 to five, 45 minutes per day, Monday through Thursday, and there's some additional time on Friday. So some changes since we last reviewed this with you all. Uh, obviously, when we uh, after the last meeting, we met, had a meeting with transportation and talked about schedules, logistics, and uh, one of the things we realized at that point was looking at shuttle runs and all of the puzzle pieces that go into what Mr. Wills and his team does, uh, magicians uh, with the uh, creating those routes and, and making sure that um, optimal capacity, et cetera. So uh, all of that information to say that uh, for us, it makes sense to have traditional school start times at the ele elementary, middle and high school level. So what you'll see reflected in these schedules is this is a schedule and it'll say at the top, whether it's an early school or a late school. In this case, this is an early start school. So this school goes from 730, you'll see here to 205 down at the bottom here. And so it breaks it out and gives parents an idea of a sample schedule. And this is pre-K through two of what it would look like. So uh, we have here in the, at the, in the elementary grades, you'll see that Monday through Thursday, we have teachers again at the elementary level. If I'm working with in-person learners in phase two, I'm just working with in-person learners. If I'm working with virtual learners in phase two, I'm just working with virtual learners at the elementary level. And so for in-person teachers, they'll be meeting on Mondays and Wednesdays with one group of in-person learners, and then Tuesdays and Thursdays with another group of in-person learners, and again, all in-person. And then on Fridays, for all grade levels, actually elementary, middle, and high, Fridays will be virtual. So even though these are in-person learners, this is an in-person learner schedule, you'll see here when you drill down to the details, on Friday, they've got two hours to meet with their in-person learners, but online. And so they've got two groups there. The other thing we heard from building administrators, they thought it was important because it's difficult to do Monday through Thursday at the elementary level to have common planning time where virtual teachers can plan with in-person teachers. So we've built that into the schedule for Friday. So we have some additional planning time on Friday, as well as if teachers want some time for remediation. So those are the elementary schedules. Again, I won't go through all of them. They are, are listed on, on the website. Uh, going down to uh, high school and middle school, which won't take as long to explain, uh, you'll see those posted here as well. And the high school and middle school, I just want to rehash again what we shared last week that at the middle school level, let me pull it up here. So at the middle school level, one teacher who right now is teaching, let's say, 24 students in her first class of English on a Monday, 
Uh, that class, based on the numbers that Dr. Smith shared or talked about earlier, where 50% perhaps want to stay at home in a phase two, 50% want to come to in-person learning. So in-person learners would come on Mondays and Wednesdays. Those teachers would be teaching them. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, those same teachers would be teaching their virtual learners. And then on Fridays, all students, all 24 of those students come back together as one class. Again, virtual uh, instruction would take place on Friday. So we've got the details of that schedule here. And then at the high school level, it's fairly straightforward. So the high school, all four of our high schools start at 820 and they dismiss at 309. Those were times pre-pandemic. Uh, right now during phase one, we've shortened that so that they have four classes a day. I have four classes on Monday and then I have my next four classes the, f the following day, let's say Tuesday. And so those are 60 minute classes under phase one. Both the middle school and the high school when we move to phase two would be 90 minute classes, so a full school day. So all four of our high schools, for example, would go from 820 to 309. What this schedule reflects here is every day, every Monday and Wednesday will be day one. I have those same four classes on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then I have this, the other four classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then again, Fridays are set aside for office hours and remediation. So what we've shared with teachers, uh, we met with a number of teachers yesterday, and what we shared uh, with teachers as far as expectation around a work week is that we would be moving in phase two, a requirement expectation that teachers would be on site on campus uh, unless they have that medical documentation and signed off on. They would be on site four days a week, Monday through Thursday, and Friday in phase two would be an e-commute day. At all levels, they would be engaging virtually with students. Now, with the caveat, and we shared with teachers that if principals do need to call in a grade level, a faculty for whatever reason, uh, that they would have the authority to do that. But for the most part, Fridays in phase two would be an e-commute day. In reference to professional development, we just wanted to share a few things here. Again, yesterday, we had about 450 teachers join us for staff webinars. We had a separate section for elementary and a separate section for uh, secondary. We had the chance to answer a number of questions and, and uh, share with them some of the information we're sharing with the board this evening, as well as what we shared two weeks ago. One of the things we've been working on for the last couple of weeks, anticipating a return to a modified in-person schedule, was what resources could we create that would provide some guidance to teachers of what would this look like? What would this model look like? So pre-K through 12, over the last couple of weeks, we've had members of of the curriculum instruction team, digital learning specialists, classroom teachers collaborating on these resources that will be shared at the beginning of next week. And for those at home who want to get a, a sneak preview of this, you can click on that elementary science link and that would take you to uh, this video here. And I'm just gonna play just a, the, about 30 seconds of this. So this is one where our science department under the direction of Ms. Venetia Farrell, uh, you'll see that she collaborated with a fifth grade teacher at Cary. And so all uh, elementary science teachers, for example, would be receiving uh, this particular resource here. Hello, I'm Ms. Venetia Farrell, the science curriculum leader for Hampton City Schools. And today we are taking a visit to an elementary science classroom to talk about HCS science safety in the lab. With us this morning, we have Ms. Melissa Dickerson. She's a fifth grade science teacher at Cary Elementary School. And she's graciously allowed us to come into her room and to go through some setup and to actually show you some different configurations and to kind of go through some of the requirements. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the rationale for the actual setup. And we're gonna talk about some of the requirements that you need to um, make sure that you put into place for social distancing in your science classroom. We're also going to talk about what science should look like K through three and in fifth grade. We're going to look at classroom configuration. Some of the tables are set up for that. And we're going to talk about some of the science roles, which you see behind me. And we're also going to talk about cleaning protocol, which we're going to call wipe in, wipe out. So if, if I were to go through that, she's got a number of slides in there, but basically walking teachers through uh, what it would look like in a science instructional block at the elementary level. And uh, as she shared some of the agenda items uh, on that particular video. And so we have that for just about every area. 
and again, working with Channel 46 filming. And so we're slicing and dicing those videos now, putting together for, for training. So for elementary and middle school teachers, we're planning to roll that out electronically via email next week. So as an elementary teacher, I can expect to see, receive one email and it has a table and the tables it will have different content areas to include resource teachers. I can simply click on that one folder and it gives me access to all of these additional resources, again, to help with this transition to uh, modified in-person instruction. For high school teachers, based on that model, which we've mentioned earlier in a couple of weeks ago, we felt it was important really to spend some time and, and to be honest, do a lot of hand-holding. So we've done a lot of research and we're working in classrooms with teachers right now, actually modeling this action research with teachers and students and again, working through uh, what is the best technology that we need to purchase. So we're almost there. And so that training will take place. We'll have an hour with each group of high school teachers on November 6th. Dr. Haynes and I are meeting with high school principals and middle school principals next week uh, to continue to flesh out the, those details. And then uh, lastly, uh, Ms. Judge, I know our director of special education who's on the call this evening, she's also been working in a similar capacity. She works collaboratively with our curriculum leaders as well, and but also doing some things for our uh, teachers of students with disabilities. So this is a, a screenshot I just took of one of her presentations that she's done, giving her teachers an idea, for example, in a self-contained setting, what a model classroom looks like, and again, providing some guidance to our teachers. So at this time, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation back over to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Caggiano. Uh, so Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board, so this really, this presentation uh, was a follow-up to what we shared during the um, October 7th uh, board meeting. And so unless I hear otherwise this evening, uh, we will move forward with a modified in-person return to school beginning with stage one of phase two at the earliest time possible during the second nine weeks. And that would be uh, stage one of phase two. Um, we all know that these circumstances require that we continue to focus on safety mitigation actions for all, as well as uh, that all of us that we must remain flexible in our approach. As such, we will proceed with November the 4th as our targeted uh, start date. Mr. Chairman, I will turn it back over to you uh, for any remaining questions from the board. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Caggiano and Nurse Gill. Uh, excellent presentation. At this time, I'd like to give each of the board members a chance uh, to comment on the superintendent's recommended plan. And so I will start with uh, the vice chair, Dr. Woodhouse. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I do have a, a few questions. Um, if you would entertain those questions for me quickly, I would appreciate it. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask this question. Uh, you, you were saying that teachers will work with in-person learners and virtual learners respectively. What level is that at? And also you said that teachers will work on Mondays and Wednesday with in-person learners and then Tuesdays and Thursdays with virtual learners and then on Friday it would be uh, everyone would be virtual learners so I'm sort of confused on what levels that was and then I'll ask the other questions after I get an answer to those sure thank you uh, Dr. Woodhouse I mean I think the first question was relative to uh, the virtual and in-person, that would be at the high school level. So the high school level, uh, the teachers will only work with in-person, in-person learners. Uh, they, they would have in-person as well as virtual. That's how to, okay. Yes, yeah. Uh, next question would be, what happens if the, uh, if the virus continues to increase in the Hampton? What are we planning to do? Uh, in, play, in, in, in the situation that that would continue to be as it is now, because if I'm not mistaken, uh, Nurse Gill said that we are right now at high risk or moderate risk. Uh, in some of the categories, uh, it was high risk and the second uh, metrics, it was um, one was high risk and then moderate. Um, and let me just share that we would continue to work with uh, the health department 
as a part of our decision making uh, process. Um, and certainly an uptick would not necessarily indicate that um, uh, that it would necessarily be a school closure, uh, but we would monitor situations with the health department and respond appropriately. And the key fact for us is to make certain that we have uh, in place the appropriate mitigation strategies uh, to on the front end be proactive and as preventative as, as possible. And that satisfies the questions that I have for right now. Sure. Thank you. And I don't know if Nurse Gill desires to uh, expand upon any of the information in terms of uh, the mitigation that that uh, strategies and so forth. No, Dr. Smith, you're, you're doing a great job. I'll just turn it all over to you. How about that? <laughs> now, you're, um, I, I, we are, Dr. Woodhouse, we are going to have um, fluctuations. And, and I did say that before, but I really feel that so long as we're monitoring that, which we are, and we're in con contact with both the immediate Hampton Health Department, but also the um, Hampton Roads Park, the Newport News Peninsula uh, Health Department as well on a weekly basis. Um, I think that we're, we are keeping an eye on it. I think that we're doing the, the best job we can do to make sure that when those students and staff are in the building that we, we follow the mitigation plans we've submitted to the Department of Education, as well as to you, um, we're going to do the best job that we can. And um, we're gonna have a few cases, that's, that's just inevitable. But I think that um, with the plans that we have in place, I think that we can um, be healthy, be safe, and at the same time provide an excellent education, which we have in the past. I think that the presentation was a wonderful presentation uh, this evening. Um, I am uh, always um, questioning the, the best that we have for our kids to be uh, done. The safety is, is, al is always as important as the academics, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we have to make sure that our kids are safe as, and, in a, and, and in an environment where they are safe and can learn at the same time. We say uh, um, every day, uh, whatever it takes, but we wanna make sure that when we uh, work with um, letting our kids come back to school in such a challenging time that we have now, that we make sure that um, we're doing everything that's in the best interest of the, of the kids. I believe that that's what we are doing here in Hampton, but I also want to say that um, we want to make sure that not only the uh, parents of the of children uh, feel that we are doing the best for the kids, but I want to make sure that uh, all of our stakeholders feel like that we're doing the best that we can for the children as well. Uh, we say that Hampton is a great place to come and um, set up your businesses and um, we have the best uh, <coughs> educational system, I feel, one of the best educational systems uh, in the country. And so with that being said, I also feel like that we want to make sure that we uh, impress upon our stakeholders that we are teaching our children also how to be flexible and adjust to change. And so that's important as well. So I'm, I'm through, that's all I have to say, uh, Mr. President, and uh, I'd like to hear what the other uh, members have to say also. Okay, and just real quick, Dr. Woodhouse, just to be clear, are you in support of the superintendent's recommended plan? We said to the superintendent that uh, he has the uh, authority to make the decisions on this. Uh, so I'm in support of the superintendent's plan. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Woodhouse. Uh, Ms. Cherry. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I took a couple of notes here as usual. Um, I like Dr. Woodhouse would like to just ask a, a couple of clarifying questions if I may. Um, I saw on this slide we talked about, you don't have to go to the slide. This is just an answer. I saw where the pre-K and the um, ESL children and 
special ed, they would be notified of their bus routes by their bus drivers. What about the sixth grade students? Dr. Kajan, you want to respond? I know that you've been in contact, but yes, that would be a part of the process as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that is correct. I think by the time that when that video was made, you know, again, as Dr. Smith mentioned, fluid and nimble, I think sixth graders uh, were not a part of the conversation. And then after speaking with administrators, we did add them. So, um, but we, we will, uh, I will reach out to, to Mr. Wills to, to ensure that, uh, that any, any and all students in stage one, so K through 12, for example, students with disabilities, English language learners, everyone who is, who's accounted for in stage one. Okay, thank you. I just noticed that wasn't in there and I thought maybe we were doing something different. Good, good so, catch on that PR and marketing side. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, um, another, um, this isn't a question as much as it is, it's a comment, um, Nurse Gill. I noticed we said that we would be doing random temperature checks with our children. Yes, ma'am. But quite honestly, we're not, um, we're not pulling anybody out or citing anybody because isn't this what we do anyway during flu season? Um, in flu season, we do that within the clinic compounds, which we will continue to do anyway. Um, with uh, if, a, if a teacher has some concerns just in general, you know, mm -hmm. we can do a random check, but not pull any one per. That's why we're going to do a classroom, not not a, a specific child, if there's a concern there. On the most part, though, I can honestly say say in our training that we've done with the teachers is that they would be sent a child, you know, they just said, oh, you're not feeling well, no problem, go go check with the nurse, you know, right. and that way it's not COVID where we're, we did stress that, that at no point do you make a comment because, you know, kids hear things, see things. So we're, we're working on making sure that that's not addressed uh, in a negative way. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that response. And um, the other piece speaks to the staffing. I, I do, I am very excited about the fact that as far as our students are concerned, we know the expectations and parents will know the expectations and that they'll be asked to sign a document and that that document will also have the consequences if little Johnny does not wear his mask, correct? Could you just expound on that just a little bit, um, Dr. Smith? I think the community would be interested in knowing that. Absolutely. And so we've taken the um, expectations and really developed that into an agreement. Uh, and at the bottom, we would ask um, the uh, parent or guardian, along with the student, to uh, sign off that, number one, they read and that they clearly understand or they understood what they read in terms of those expectations and the consequence that if a particular child or children, students, um, student or students decide to not adhere to uh, there is the possibility that the student would return to virtual learning. Um, we have to ensure that we're following the expectations and the protocols uh, to not only create, but to maintain a safe environment. And so we're, we're going to ask uh, parents as well as guardians uh, along with the student. Uh, so we're asking the parent or uh, parents and guardians to review it with the, the student uh, with, with their child and then sign off uh, that they clearly read and that there's a clear understanding. And certainly if there are questions, they can reach out to us, but we cannot have an environment, learning environment where uh, young people or adults um, are not willing to adhere to uh, the protocols um, right. and the expectations. So absolutely. And, and in the final paragraph, we have identified specifically uh, what that consequence might be. Likewise, uh, when we're also dealing with uh, adults, um, the expectations we're asking, we will be asking um, all staff to sign off as well and to understand that there are consequences if we don't follow uh, those expectations and protocols as well. It's the only way that we're gonna really uh, make certain that we're creating and maintaining the, uh, an environment that is safe and, and healthy. Um, thank you. And you said the staff will also be following the same protocols. That is correct. And uh, we have identified uh, uh, policies uh, coupled with both uh, on the student side as well as on the staff side. And certainly on the student side, uh, the rights and responsibility uh, uh, handbook uh, will be cited as, as one of 
the areas in terms of enforcement. Okay, thank you. And that's segued right into, <clears throat> excuse me, my final question. And it's not really a question as much as it is a comment. Uh, many of us on the board and you as yourself, Dr. Smith and your staff, you know, for those people who are interested in us getting back to school as usual, um, a lot of times we've heard the comment where well, Hampton's numbers are low. So what we need to do is go by Hampton's numbers. But I would just like to just suggest that while we may have, I would say what 99% of our students enrolled in Hampton City Schools actually live in Hampton, that is not the case with our staff and our teachers and our bus drivers who live all over. So I'm glad to see that you are putting in, in place those staff protocols as well. As far as the plan is concerned, which the chairman asked me to speak about, I think that this plan is excellent. The plan is, is exemplary. It is tight. It is one that is um, impressive. And I think your numbers from the faculty and staff members who said they'd be willing to come back, Dr. Smith, I think that's based on the fact that our staff trust you and your administration. And with a plan like this that is so well laid out, with the component, with the website, with the, um, the ability for parents to click on and see videos. You know, a lot of people visual, they don't wanna read a whole lot of stuff, but if they can click on and see um, a, a video that tells me how my child is gonna be seated on the bus or what that's gonna look like in terms of my child when I say, okay, I wanna go into the modified in person, I, th I think it speaks volumes in terms of planning. I mean, you were able to plan direct staff and control. So kudos to you on the plan. I think it's exceptional. And you did point out that right now your fourth date, November 4th That's is your target date, but yeah. you will continue to, as you've always done, look That's at the data, fine. see where we are, because we're not where we are today that we were this time last week. That is correct. And we could be even better. So I, I do appreciate that. I think the plan is wonderful. So Thank kudos you. to you and your staff. Thank you very much, Ms. Cherry. Uh, Mr. Samuels. Uh, thank you, I'm Chairman Kilgore for the opportunity uh, to share also my uh, um, comments as it relates to um, the superintendent's presentation. I believe that this presentation was an excellent uh, presentation um, and, and we're moving in the right direction. Uh, one thing that really impressed me was the, the data that was presented um, um, as it relates to um, family response to the survey. But I would like to also highlight that if we take a peel that um, that um, survey result back and just look at the pre-K through third grade. And if Dr. Kajiana can look at that, um, although it indicated that over, in, in generally we have, I believe Dr. Kajiano, 51% uh, of parents who stated that they would like to have in-person um, learning. However, if you look at the first one, two, three, four, five um, cells. That is a higher percentage if we are peeling this report back. So there is a greater need to support those family in pre-K, K, first, second, and third. Um, and this also aligns with the data that stated, if we look at the teacher, um, the teacher survey, Dr. Kajiana, can you also go to the teacher survey? If we look at the teacher survey, a large number of teacher on the elementary supports um, that return to school. And so it leaves me in a position that um, teachers and parents support us moving um, in, in with in-person, hybrid, modified in-person. One other thing that I also admire and really appreciate was the fact that when I brought up my two concerns about um, the uh, temperature check and um, another concern, that those concerns were addressed immediately by Dr. Smith and his staff, primarily um, Nurse Gill. 
So I really appreciate that. I know Dr. Um, Dr. Smith really took into consideration where we were on um, doing our um, previous meeting. So I say that all to say that I am in support of moving forward with um, Dr. Smith's recommendation. And, I, and, and for the fact that although it remains fluid, that they are also going to continue to be monitoring um, the data on a day-to-day -day basis and make some sort of modification um, as it relates to if there are any changes, increase or decrease with the number. So Dr. Smith and yours, and I just want to say um, kudos to Dr. Smith and his staff uh, for this thorough, thoughtful, and um, in the weeds um, report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Samuels. Dr. Mason. Good evening, good evening. Um, I will start off by saying as well, I think it is a well put together plan. Um, I do have a couple of questions um, and I've already had talked with Dr. Smith uh, and uh, Dr. Caggiano about this because I wanted to see the survey just in terms of what the teachers were asked. And if you look back at the survey, the survey really focuses on the teacher's abilities, whether or not they have a doctor's note or medical excuse, but it really doesn't focus on whether or not the teachers feel comfortable with coming back. And I think that should be also addressed in where teachers fall, because it may give us a false sense of security with the data that we receive, because we can make statistics say whatever we want them to say based on what we ask. And so I think we, we need to look at that because it really just speaks to the ability, you know, about whether or not they can return back to work versus whether or not they have a comfort level or what is their comfort level returning back to in person, because I'm sure they're concerned, especially some of our, our educators who may be taking care of elderly parents and all, I'm sure they would not want to run the risk of catching COVID from one of their students, because like Nurse Gill said, you know, a few cases will be inevitable, you know, but what happens in that situation where that inevitable case, the teacher takes COVID home, you know, to his or her elderly parent? You know, God forbid that happens. And so I think we need to ask the teachers that because they have to be of concern as well for the division. And I, I know we are, you know, looking out for them, but we need to make sure we're hearing from them um, in that regard. Um, now, the other question I have just in terms of the, the schedules, um, how much input did the teachers provide in the development of, of those schedules? Because I know um, teaching, it takes a lot of time doing more stuff by Zoom and virtual uh, in preparation from especially turning some of our face-to-face our -face lessons into a modified virtual lesson. And so just looking at the schedule, how much input did the teachers provide in that development? You want to uh, start? I can start off by saying that uh, I'll start with yesterday. I know that um, we asked for uh, specific input in and also provided uh, teachers with an opportunity to respond uh, and give us uh, concerns or questions earlier on as part of yesterday's webinar, um, prior to yesterday's webinar. So that certainly um, helps to influence or help to influence, but I'll let Dr. Caggiano talk in terms of the specifics leading up to the webinar uh, on yesterday. And, and also Dr. Mason, I'll just say to the point, um, you know, we, we afforded uh, staff members uh, elementary and secondary on yesterday uh, with uh, two webinars where they could uh, certainly remotely participate in, in Zoom um, or in, in their remote participation could uh, call in and, um, and it signaled to us, um, we hope that uh, individuals had some degree of comfort and confidence where we didn't get an overwhelming number of individuals um, who had concerns in terms of uh, the, the, the webinars. Yes, there were some, so I don't want to, uh, to say that we didn't have some, but we've certainly tried to address that. But more specifically to your question, uh, Dr. Cajano. 
Thank you, Dr. Smith. Yes, Dr. Mason, good question. So, you know, we've had multiple opportunities for stakeholders, internal stakeholders to engage. So uh, following the first board meeting, those schedules that we shared in the first board meeting, uh, not only did uh, administrators have the opportunity, uh, curriculum leaders, teacher specialists, and when we had an initial meeting, kind of the charges go back to a group of stakeholders as well. So a lot of whether you were a principal on the team, assistant principal on the team, uh, you know, you took back to some of your uh, informal leaders in the building, various grade levels, et cetera. Curriculum leaders, teacher specialists have some go-to teachers, as you well know, who write curriculum for us, and they did the same thing on their end. Fast forward, then we come back together and we say, okay, we have an, a shell now, and then now we need to really flesh out a detailed sample schedule. Same thing, we brought back Dr. Owens, for example, gave me a, a new list of administrators for us to work with, uh, principals, assistant principals, same thing. Now we go back out, they provide feedback, they go to another group of teachers, give again opportunity to give feedback same thing with curriculum leaders teacher specialists along the way i would say probably more input at the elementary and middle school level uh, dr haynes and i have had ongoing conversations looking at a variety of master schedules at the high school level and because of uh, the eight schedules we run over the course of two days we're somewhat limited as to what that model can look like and so we believe we have selected the optimal model and it does involve actually as as we've talked about teachers teaching two sets of students and that's why we believe we need to provide some some additional professional learning for that particular model mm -hmm. i hope that answers your question yeah it, it does like i said i'm just concerned about the teacher input just looking at that because i know a lot of times the teachers are concerned about planning time because even during their planning time i think it was i think i saw something about 30 minutes a day um, at what point are the teachers able to eat something and actually plan all at the same time? Because that's, that's a really fast and a short period of time there. And I know traditionally, even with face-to-face, um, -face, not even in a COVID situation, that's always a concern of, of educators not having enough time for planning sure. on their own, because as soon, you know, you may give them this time period, but um, they don't have time to do those things and they end up taking, you know, papers home to grade and a number of different things, you know, so I'm just right. thinking as stressful as this COVID situation is, especially, and we're doing this, you know, is that 30 minute window enough time for our teachers during the, during the work week? So uh, at the middle school level, teachers will receive their traditional planning time five days a week. That'll be 90 minutes a day. At the high school level, from Monday through Thursday, they'll receive their traditional planning time, 90 minutes a day. And of course, they've got a lot more time on, on Friday with no students on Friday, with the exception of some remediation. At the elementary level, as you're aware, we have two sets of teachers. If I'm a teacher of in-person learners, I have a 45 minute planning period every day, Monday through Thursday. And then I have a two hour planning period on Friday. So above and beyond what we typically do. If I'm an in-person, if I'm a virtual teacher at the elementary level, and that's the one I mentioned and that you referenced as well, mm -hmm. I'm teaching two groups of students, which we're doing now in phase one. I'm teaching eight to 11, one group. Then I have an hour break and then I teach 12 to three, the second group. And I do that Monday through Thursday. And so, yes, in that case, you have a 30 minute planning and a 30 minute lunch. And as a former fifth grade teacher and fourth grade teacher, I could say, you know, you're not factoring in that that 10 minutes. I'm taking students down to the cafeteria and back because I'm shutting off at 11 o'clock. I've got an unencumbered hour by myself. Um, and so I'm not dealing with students transitioning during that time as well. Those teachers then on Friday also have two hours. So actually, when you look at the even the elementary level over the course of one week, they're getting more planning time in this model uh, than they would in a traditional school year. And then just the last thing, just in terms of looking at where we are with the being in the high risk, moderate risk um, and low risk categories. Um, I, I think we're doing a great job as far as putting this plan together. And, and I, you know, I've commended uh, Dr. Smith and you, Dr. Caggiano, in terms of what has been done. You can definitely see the work. Um, my reservations and concerns have always been with this virus itself, you know, because there's so many uncertainties about where it is in, in terms of the numbers and everything. And that's always going to be my biggest concern. And we may talk you know, a percentage of 5.1% being a moderate risk. But, you know, this past, you know, seven days, you know, the numbers that I just received, we've had 12 cases of COVID here, right here in Hampton within the past seven, seven days. And 
that's a, that number to me is high, you know, because it can spread quickly. You know, if we have three of those cases that end up in a school, how fast will that, ten, you know, that situation spread amongst our, our folks, you know? And so I think um, we definitely need to, you know, proceed with caution, you know? And I know at some point we are going to have to, you know, take a chance and open the schools, but I really think we need to proceed with a little more caution and that's where my reservation is. Um, and it, at least if we can take a look at the numbers and, you know, across the board, you know, find ourselves in all of those low risk categories. Um, but I, I think we, we, we should throw caution to the wind when we remain in the highest risk in certain categories and, and, and moderate risk in, in, in certain categories. And, and trust me, I, I get it. And I'll say it again. I, I know that we have to we're concerned with the number of students, that 23% of the students that we have that are, are struggling, you know, um, and also our pre-K through third grade students. I, you know, I, I look at the number and numbers and I, and I understand the data and, and everything, and especially as it relates to, you know, child development and, and education. But I think, like I said, we also have to look at that and, and, that's still, you know, of concern to me, you know, because although we talk these percentages, you know, once again, I'll, I'll say it again, 100% of the kids who die from COVID, we won't be able to catch them up. And so that that is a critical concern for me. So I, I support, you know, the plan itself, but I still have reservations about the timeline as far as implementation. But great job, you know, Dr. Smith, you know, you guys are doing a wonderful job in terms of putting this thing together. And my reservation is not with the division's abilities. And I want that to be known um, because I support what the division is doing. Uh, my reservation, of course, like I said, is with the uncertainty of, of what's happening with this virus and the community doing what we need to do so that we don't give our children COVID and have them take this to school and spread it. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Miss mm -hmm. Banks Gray. Thank you so much, Chairman Kilgore. Um, Dr. Smith, now I do have, um, I did have a major concern and you kind of hit on it talking to um, Dr. Uh, Woodhouse actually raised this. And my main concern is, um, was if we happen to see, and once we have the uh, students in the actual classrooms, if we did see an uptick in a school the strategies that we plan on uh, having in place, if we did see that, and you alluded to not necessarily shutting down the school itself, can you elaborate a little more on that for me, please, sir? Sure, uh, Ms. Banks, great. So for example, it may require that uh, we address it within a specific classroom, or it may be a particular grade level. Um, but again, that will be contact tracing uh, and working with the uh, school nurse and certainly nurse skill um, and the health department to make that determination. Um, so I don't want to have that false sense of um, a particular case would necessarily dictate that we're gonna close the school down, but through contact tracing, make an informed decision as to whether or not it was isolated to a particular classroom. And it may have been just a group of students, but that would be working with um, the school nurse, um, along with Nurse Gill and uh, the health department to make that determination. And certainly if the need were to exist, that we felt that it was in the best interest, uh, certainly from a safety and health perspective to close a, an entire school down, we would not hesitate to do so. That's good to know. Um, and like I've said um, time and time again, there is no true blueprint for us navigating through a, a pandemic. Um, with having uh, talks with you, um, we all know it's important to consider the full spectrum of the benefits and the risk of both in-person and um, virtual learning options. And I know Dr. Smith, like I said, through conversations with you and your staff, that you have done a, uh, you've done your research um, to ensure that every possible measure has been taken to um, protect our students, teachers, staff, 
and all of their families. And I do applaud um, the actual thorough plan that you have presented to us and I appreciate it. But um, such as uh, Dr. Uh, Mason, I do have my reservations and want to make sure that we are not going to be labeled as a super spreader, um, but you have done an amazing job and I applaud you all for that. I applaud your efforts. Ms. Banks Gray, may I uh, um, just give a little bit of additional information in yes, reference to contract tracing? What we've been doing since um, March in, in with our employees is if they show symptoms, even if we're not sure, you know, if they seem COVID-like symptoms, we put them on a quarantine at home. All right, we, we say you go home, you, you um, stay there till we get some more details. So even let, let's just say, that there was a student that was positive COVID. Through discussion with Hampton Health Department and, and, and the leadership, we, it would not be out of our, our realm of actually sending a class home just till we get all the contact tracing versus having them stay there and, and, and potentially continuing that. Um, we have done that with staff members that we send them home. If they can work from home, great, but if they can't, then we go through our um, human resources. But I wanna say that we, we really have, we don't err on the side of, well, we want you in work. We err on the side of, well, it's, we're not sure. So I'd like you to go home and then we'll monitor you. The nurses follow up on them. I have followed up on, on those that are not in a hospital, in a school-based um, place. And so I can say at least from how we've been handling employees that we are doing the extra steps or the cautionary steps to at least address some of the concerns you've mentioned as well as, as other board members. So I hope that that at least shows from our track record of what we are doing with contact tracing. Okay, I do appreciate that information. And once again, Dr. Smith, like I said, I do applaud your efforts. Job well done, sir. Thank you, Ms. Banks Gray. And uh, Ms. Jackson Afonso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to say that I'm extremely excited about the opportunity for our youth to return um, to a modified in-person learning situation. Um, we, we do have a number of vulnerable students um, who are having a significant amount of challenges in the virtual learning environment. And I think that, um, you know, as a division, we do have to be considerate of those, of those individuals. Obviously, safety is everyone's paramount concern. Um, but I have full confidence in the division's preparation I don't have any real questions about it. Um, I just, I, I feel like that from the very beginning, we, we voted that the, um, that we will return to the, to school 100% virtual and that the phase re-entry would be at the discretion of the superintendent and his division leadership team. And that's pretty much where I stand today that, that, that would, we would continue to, um, to do that, to follow our superintendent as well as the division leadership teams and their discretions about returning to, um, to in-person learning. And so I'm, I'm excited about young people returning to the school environment. I believe that each time we've met extra protections, continuous enhancements have been um, done to the plan. The plan is extremely tight. Um, I think that I, I don't know what other considerations could be made at this point um, that would, you know, would, would further protect our young people. I think, as Nurse Gill said, that, you know, we, we are in a pandemic and, and we can expect that some young people potentially and, and some staff will become infected, you know, and I think that the mitigation strategies that have been put in place by our division um, provide a high level of protection, added protections each time that we've met. And I'm just 100% on board with, with the plan uh, for return. And I, and I do wanna say we're only considering those individuals who desire to return. We're not even considering those who don't want to come back. At this point, we're only considering um, families and young people who desire to come back. So I'm on board with the plan. I think it's excellent. Um, I think the protections are, are extremely um, well planned out, thought out. And um, I, I'm, I feel very confident that students can return safely. 
And so thank you so much, Dr. Smith, and to your division leadership team and to everyone who has been um, working so diligently on the plan. And um, I, I feel very confident about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Afonja. And before I give my comments, I wanted to give our student rep, Mr. Karnick, a chance to comment if he had any. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few questions. Uh, number one, I'd like to uh, ask specifically about the the in-person phase two start times for those early elementary schools and those uh, those high I think your microphone stopped working there, Mr. Carnett. Is anyone else hearing Paul? My connection is not great. I apologize if I cut out. Just let me know and I'm happy to repeat my question. Um, but what I was trying to get at, I don't know how much you heard, but uh, is there a particular reason whether that's state instructional hour requirements that we, um, if under our modified in-person return to learning plan that we are going back at 820 for those high school students and uh, 730, 745 for those early elementary school students rather than the current start times in the virtual learning, I should say. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Smith, I can take that if you'd like. Sure, and uh, go, go right go right ahead. Certainly, yes, uh, Mr. Karnak. So um, in, in the, after the board meeting, uh, the last board meeting the following Monday, Executive Directors, Dr. Haynes, Dr. Owens, and myself met with Mr. Wills in transportation. And uh, one of the, the, the pieces, uh, you know, not, not trying to live in his world and him helping us to understand the puzzle pieces associated with it. And because of not only the buses with these shuttles we use for the academies, and you look at some of our buses that go to regional centers as well, that uh, when you look at, at pushing up, because we had a couple of weeks back, we had some, uh, let's say 30 minutes less at the elementary time, 30 minutes less at the middle school time. And there would be no way that we could transport students in that case. Follow up conversation with Dr. Smith. And at some point we are hopeful that we would transition back to all students coming back this school year. And uh, so the thinking was that when and if that opportunity arises, we will have already gone back with our traditional time. So the start times you'll see for each one of our schools is reflective of what they were pre-pandemic and so primarily uh, transportation but also some additional uh, instructional time for for students as well dr smith yeah that is, that is correct uh, because at some particular point um, um, as you indicated um, we may very well uh, return to uh, a full instructional day we're hopeful of that um, uh, without any guarantees and so if you start with one schedule and then you'd have to go and readjust and ask families to readjust that particular schedule. So it's best to start with um, those schedules, given all of the modifications and extra runs uh, that transportation would need, need to do. Okay, uh, thank you. And then so a few other questions. So uh, for those random mask checks that are, or excuse me, those random temperature checks that are going on, uh, uh, apologies for the error. Will students in that that mask agreement that students sign, they say, I understand the consequences of not wearing my mask. I understand these are the expectations. When they sign that agreement, are they um, are they signing that with the part as part of that? Will they have the knowledge that they may be subject to random temperature checks depending on the circumstances? Uh, very good question. I included language for that uh, on, on yesterday. So I provided Ms. Hatcher with uh, language to include the uh, random uh, temperature checks as a part of that agreement. Okay, uh, thank you. And then another question about related to that. So um, I understand I heard from uh, I heard from this presentation that the the mass check uh, for temperature checks, those random checks, they're we're doing uh, room scale checks rather than individual um, measurements uh, to not just isolate a particular student. Is there an additional epidemiological benefit to uh, checking a class of students en masse? Um, I mean, and that can go to nurse skill. I'm not really too familiar on that. Um, I'm not sure if I understood your question related to masks being on in a check or the temperature being on, uh, being checked. Okay, uh, my apologies on that. Uh, so the, my question specifically relates to the decision to do um, temperature checks um, 
for the whole classroom rather than for individual students at a time? Is there, uh, is there an additional epidemiological benefit to checking everyone in a room's temperature versus a particular student's temperature? The reason that we chose not to, it's a good, que good question. Uh, the reason we chose not to do just that individual, because that individual could be sent down to um, the uh, clinic to be checked as well. But we don't want, what we don't want to do is to say, okay, uh, Paul, will you come out to the, the uh, hallway and we wanted to check your temperature or something like that? I, I don't know. In high school, well, I can only imagine, I used to be one where I was in high school, so I can imagine how they would be treated. Oh, Paul has COVID and he is going to be probably going home soon. So we don't want that. So if we did everybody and I go, oh, Paul does have a temperature and we in some form or another do take you out um, in a different time period, um, that would be how we would handle it. It would be more of a, uh, it's escaping me the term, but no one knows that why we've checked the whole room. Um, it's just a random check and we can do that, um, especially uh, as we have the ability to, because obviously in the mornings we wouldn't be doing that because we're going to be pretty busy checking kids anyway that are being sent down from the classrooms. But it is a good question, but we just don't want to uh, point a finger or make one child feel, you know, conscious about it. It's sort of like when we had head lice, we didn't like doing the whole class because, or we, if we, we did it, we would do the whole class because we didn't want to isolate one child. So not that they're equal, but. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, since you spoke on that more, I, I think I un understand more the benefit of not, you know, isolating a particular student just right. so that um, misinformation doesn't get created or spread uh, necessarily based on preconceived notions. Thank you. And it, and it does happen not even just related to COVID. It has other um, implications on that too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carnick. Um, and so I, I just want to, again, thank Dr. Smith and Dr. Conigliano and uh, Ms. Nurse Gill for the presentation. I think one of the things, and I know Ms. Jackson Afanja touched on it, is in phase one, we eliminated choice. We, we had 100% virtual. Phase two brings us to a point where we are now uh, giving parents choice um, and you know I think that that is that's a major milestone for sure but the choice includes that if you're not comfortable with all of the safety protocols that we have put in place that you can remain virtual um, but you also have the option of sending your child uh, to in-person school noting though that um, at least for pre-K through uh, fifth grade or through, I'm sorry, eighth grade, uh, there are still virtual components to the day. Um, and the other thing, if, uh, if heaven forbid something was to happen, you potentially are gonna go back to virtual on very short notice. Um, but what I really like about this is the enhancements that you continue to make. And one of the most significant in my mind is the air purifiers that you are adding to the classroom. CDC recommendations talk about air filtration and they talk about maximizing the amount of outside air. But one of the best things that you can do is get a HEPA filter in there like you've done and purify that air. So again, uh, kudos to the division for purchasing those air purifiers. They were very expensive, but uh, uh, an expense well appreciated. Um, and I believe that, you know, the, the basic safety protocols of mask, social distancing, and hygiene, we have said since day one. So I really, and then we've just built on that and enhanced on that. And we've, we've really, um, hammered home the expectations that everybody comply with those things. I think it really puts us in a strong position to where when you think about what people have described as super spreaders, we're never going to be in that situation. We're never going to be in a situation where you have no social distancing or no mask or, or things like that. Granted, there will not be a scenario that's 100% risk-free, but we are 
I, I think we are probably, we could stand our division's plan up to any other divisions and say, we think we've done everything that we can and now we're ready to give parents uh, the choice to teach in person. And I will say that uh, a tremendous number of the staff um, do want to teach in person um, for relationships and effectivity and all the, all the right reasons. Um, and what I've heard tonight, Dr. Smith, and, and I will join uh, that position is that I believe we have a consensus from the board that supports your recommendation. So again, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to updates at our next meeting as well. Thank you so much and to the members of the board as well. Mr. Thank Chair, I, I do have one quick question. Sure. Okay, with the teachers being back, how many COVID cases have we had in any of the buildings so far? And I can get you that information. I know that we send it to the board on a weekly basis, um, or if not a daily basis, but let me get that to you in terms of um, uh, the calculation of that. Okay, so I, we have, but we have had some COVID cases in the buildings. Yes, uh, and, but now, and, and again, um, I think it's important to note through contact tracing, um, not from the point of, of getting COVID as a result of working in the building, Correct. but outside of the, of the building. And I think, you know, to the point of Mr. Kilgore, we may find that the classrooms with the purifiers, uh, air purifiers and so forth, may be a far healthier place for individuals in the building, in classrooms, than, than some of the other uh, spaces that we, that we may find ourselves. Um, but yes, uh, Nurse Gill? Well, I don't have the numbers in front of me, which we will get to you, but um, I can say it's it's fairly low. I, I, I'm, I've been pleased to see it because we've been keeping track of any positive cases and if there was any um, sharing, if you will, of, within the buildings. And we really haven't seen that, which is, which is a testament to the teachers that are there and the staff that are there, that they're following the procedures for the masks and the, hand, health, the health hygiene measures that we have in place. So. And they and none of them have, at this point, um, been related to the school. They've been outside sources. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Ms. Cherry. Yes, um, thank you. I just felt like um, we probably need to address or at least acknowledge the concerns that a couple of our board members had about cautioning us not to move too quickly. Um, I get that. I, I feel the same way in many respects. If you will remember, when we first started having this conversation, I was talking to Dr. Smith yesterday. I thought we should have gone all the way to January, taking the whole first semester just to see because this virus was so unique. But having said that, if I could just offer this up to them, the analogy I gave Dr. Smith yesterday was, let's pretend we're in an airplane and we found out that the spot we're supposed to land is not 100% safe. There is some risk. So we just circle and hover. But at some point, if you don't land, you're gonna run out of gas. So I think now we may be able to land this plane, but we've got an excellent plan for landing the plane. So, so I think if we can stick to the plan that the superintendent has developed along with his administrative staff and know that all of the boxes have been checked. And as Ms. Afonja said, the parents are making the decision to send the children back. We're not forcing anybody to come back into in-person. So I think if we can just keep that maybe in the forefront, that might just calm some of the fears that some people are having regarding the November 4th plan date. Although it's fluid, superintendent said that, and he will be looking at data, but I think that will go a long way in at least addressing that concern, sir. Thank you, Ms. Cherry. Any other follow-up comments from board members? If not, I will turn it back over to you, Dr. Smith. I think I'm on mute. So thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, our next uh, presenter will be actually um, Dr. Dan Bowling and members of his team to really 
uh, walk the board through and uh, our uh, individuals who are viewing uh, this particular board uh, meeting, uh, the summer capital projects and all of the investments. Um, I know that uh, many board members have had a chance along the way to hear about, to see, and, and members of, of council. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Bowling will now provide an overview of the many uh, summer capital projects that we had in place uh, and that we've been able um, to this date accomplish what we've been able to accomplish on the capital improvement side of the ledger. Let's see if Dr. Bowling. Sir. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. And I should, I should introduce by saying that Dr. Bowling serves as uh, our chief operating officer. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Carol Moore, Vice Chair, Mr. Woodhouse, members of the board, Dr. Smith and honored guests. My name is Dr. Bowling and I serve as Chief Operations Officer for Hampton City Schools. And it's my honor tonight, along with the members of my team, to report on the many wonderful improvements that we've made to our school division over this past summer. Oh, Apologies, I got to go in there. Uh, this was a very unusual summer for us. Uh, as you can imagine, working through a pandemic is, is no fun. Uh, we also had uh, early hurricanes, but my, I work with a great group of folks and they persevered, they got in there, they got the job done. Not only did they get the job done, but we can boast having completed the largest number of summer improvement projects in our department's history. So what did we actually do? We actually completely remodeled over 350,000 square feet of space. Uh, that encompasses 19 science classrooms, eight science preparation rooms, seven cafeterias, four high school fitness areas and two gymnasiums, two high school media centers, two new classroom spaces, 22 school restrooms. We landscaped five schools. We built a cybersecurity classroom and lab, a digital video production studio, a law academy, a health science classroom and lab, an entrepreneurial classroom and lab. We built a bank inside uh, Kinkatan High School's cafeteria, and we worked on 12 elementary school stages, uh, repairing those and adding curtains. So what does it take? to actually build that much space? Well, it takes 362,252 square feet of new ceiling grid, 62,735 new ceiling tiles, 90,171 square feet of new flooring, 10,000 linear feet of baseboard, 600 new storefront panels, those make up your windows and doors, 2,624 LED lights, 50 bottle filler water fountains, 25 touchscreen Promethean boards, 25 HD televisions, 98 high definition security cameras, 64,361 square feet of new ceramic tile. And once you've built those spaces, you have to fill them with something. So what do we fill them with? We filled them with 574 new cafeteria tables, 1,168 new cafeteria chairs, 128 new classroom tables, 200 new student classroom chairs, 30 teacher chairs, 66 outside park benches, and 40 outside trash receptacles. So at this time, let's take a look at what our department has done to help transform the learning environments of Hampton City Schools. We're going to start tonight with Phoebus High School. At Phoebus High School, we did a lot of work this summer. Uh, we did a digital video production studio, a cybersecurity classroom and lab. We worked on the science classrooms. We created a new cafeteria. We worked on the media center. We built a fitness area. We um, renovated bathrooms, ceiling grid and tiles. We upgraded the LED lights throughout the school and we did landscaping and outdoor seating. Now we'd like to start with our digital video production studio. Uh, good evening, my name is Phil Malillo and I'm the energy specialist for Hampton City Schools. I'd like to begin tonight's presentation uh, by talking about transforming transformation of the new digital video production studio at Phoebus High School. Transformation of this environment included demolition of the existing space, construction of the new walls, installation of new electrical services, HVAC upgrades, new ceiling tile grids and LED lights, new flooring, new electronics equipment, and new classroom, classroom furniture. Uh, the first step in the, demo, or in the transformation of these environments included the demolition of the existing space, 
included removing the old storefront windows and removal of the old ceiling grids, tiles, and lights. Had to remove the old plumbing and electrical and walls that separated the spaces. And abate the floors in preparation for brand new flooring. Uh, next step was to frame out the new walls, which included brand new metal studs, installation of new electrical service, and the hanging of new drywall. Uh, the drywall was then sanded and mudded, and we blocked up the old doorway leading between the two rooms. Next step, used metal studs to build a brand new instructional platform and covered it with plywood. Uh, added uh, fire resistant panels to the drywall to help protect it and give it a new modern look. Uh, added brand new ductwork and vents to the HVAC system and installed brand new LED lights in the space. Added new metal frames and glass windows and storefronts for the control booths. And installed new storefront doors to separate the four spaces, the labs and the learning areas. Installed new carpet in the practice areas and on the teaching platforms. And here's a shot of the completed carpeting. Uh, brand new Corian countertops installed in the space. Uh, installed brand new decorative floor tile in the learning rooms. And here's what those tile patterns look like when they're cleaned and waxed. Uh, brand new instructional equipment for the rooms, including a digital video projector and a motorized screen. Uh, brand new instructional equipment for the control booths, uh, which is included a brand new audio mixing board and new video TriCaster. We also updated the cameras to brand new state-of-the-art 4K camera equipment. Added brand new glass whiteboards and touchscreen Promethean boards to the classrooms. And here is the final transformation of the classroom. In total, we added 30 new tables and 60 new chairs to both rooms. Brand new upholstered furniture and a smart television in the green screen practice areas. And here's the final transformation of the television studio with the instructing platform and the new cameras. And the brand new control booth. Now I'd like to turn it over to Tina. Thank you, Phil. My name is Quintina Zanders. I'm the project manager for the district. I'm gonna start off by talking about Phoebus High School cybersecurity classroom and lab. The transformation of this learning environment included the demolition of the existing space, construction of new storefront walls, installation of new electrical service, new ceiling grid, tiles and LED lights, new flooring and cove base, and the installation of new cabinets, lab space, and student seating. We began by removing all the floor tile and the mastic underneath. And this is what it looks like once the floor tile is removed and cleaned up. We poured lightweight cement to level the floor to begin construction. We started by covering the uh, mezzanine walls. Here you can see them fairing it out with metal studs. Then we built the classroom's perimeter using metal stud walls. On those metal stud walls in certain areas, we went from floor to ceiling with drywall. We covered that drywall with fire rated panels. As Phil stated, it's not only decorative, but it protects the drywall. The remainder of the per perimeter of the classroom re received um, wooden wall caps in preparation for storefront frames. Here you can see the installation of the metal framing for the doors and windows. Once the metal framing was inset, we added glass to the windows and door frames. Once the perimeter of the classroom was completed, we went inside to construct new computer desks, which entailed metal studs, electrical network cables, and we drywalled the front and the back of the built-in computer desk. A classy decorative floor tile was installed throughout the classroom space. And then we began installing our countertops and cabinets. On the left-hand side, you'll see where the support brackets were installed. So we can secure the countertops to the wall in preparation of the Corian tops. Student desks were um, custom built and wired with electrical and networking services. And in this frame, you can see the Corian tops, which is a solid surface material. And here is a, a view of our completed student desk with the uh, electrical and the networking. 
We also installed server racks to house the uh, information that will be generated from this new customized cybersecurity technology. And in our final transformation here, you can see the storefront windows and the computer desk. And here's some computers along with the finished student desk, Promethean board at the front of the room. And here's a long shot of the new cybersecurity from the front of the classroom to the exit doors. Dr. Bowman. Next up, we worked on our science classrooms. Transformation of these learning environments included demolition of the existing space, construction of new walls, new electrical service, new plumbing, new ceiling grid tiles and LED lights, new flooring code base, new cabinets, lab space, and student seating. Uh, of course, we began this um, this process by dismantling all the old furniture that was there. Uh, this furniture was probably uh, at least 35 going on 40 years old. Uh, it just, the best way to say it, it seen better days, shall we say. Uh, so we had to take that all down and haul that out of the building. Next, uh, Theos High School is of a unique construction. It's an open concept design. So that allowed us to really start from scratch in the design of this science. Um, wing, if you will. We were able to remove all of the panel walls, as you can see here in this picture. We disconnected the electrical gas and the plumbing. We didn't stop there. We continued with the demolition by removing the existing ceiling grid, ceiling tiles, and light. And so we really started with a clean slate. And so we could draw back in exactly the way that we wanted these classrooms to look and bring it to a 21st century design. So you can see the guys here laying the new um, design out uh, and putting those metal studs into place for the hallways and room and prep areas. This gives you an idea here as that process continues along as we set out those walls. You get an idea of the amount of studs that go into building those classroom walls and doorways. Uh, we also found that the electrical system was woefully underpowered to that wing. So we had to bring in a new transformer and sub panel to power that whole wing. Um, and bring it up to standard. Now we can do anything we would like down there without tripping any circuits. Once that was put in, of course, we began the wiring of the walls and the electrical outlets. We also put in sound insulation in the walls so that we don't have the transmittal of sound from class to class or hallway to classroom. Once that was in, we of course did our drywall, we mudded and sanded and painted. When that was in, we did a nice decorative floor tile, again, down the hallways, classrooms, and prep areas. It really helps to dress this area up and give it that college feel. Then once we had that done, it was time to bring in the new cabinets and the new furniture. Uh, we went with metal cabinets. Uh, we did those in Phoebus colors. Unfortunately, uh, the cabinets, when they come in metal, they all come in just sheets of metal or pieces and they all have to be put together. To give you an idea of that, we put together over 200 student tables were assembled. Next, we put together the upper cabinets and we installed those. The lower cabinets went in and all of the drawer units, once we put all, all the drawers together and the glides and slides to go in, that was taken care of. And then also in the prep rooms, we made sure that we designed prep rooms between each of the classrooms so that the teachers had somewhere to store all of their equipment and supplies to teach science. And you can see the shelving units go, um, going in on each side of the room and the cabinets in the rear. We also separated and designed the lab area from the instructional area. And you can see the lab stations going in here. Once we had the skeletons in place, then we were able to put in the um, new chemical resistant countertops were installed. And then of course we had to run all of the utilities there. So we had new electrical, new faucets and sinks and supply lines and drains. And of course a new gas uh, system was put in as well. And then finally, you can see the final transformation here. You can see the cabinetry and the, the Phoebus colors. You can see the new counters the new seats, the new flooring. There. You can also see the new lap sections in the back, new fume hoods, uh, whiteboards that are there. Just another picture where you can see a, a, the same thing here. Uh, and then you have, of course, the total that we did. We did eight new science classrooms were created, just like you see here. And we also did four new prep rooms. And this is an idea of what a biology prep room looks like. You can see the beautiful cabinetry that's there so we can properly store all of that expensive equipment. And next up, we have Mr. Coberly. All right, thank you, Dr. Bowen. My name is John Coberly. I'm the maintenance and operations supervisor, and I have the new cafeteria space at Phoebus High School. 
So transformation of this space uh, included the new storefront walls, installation of H, uh, HVAC upgrades, new electrical service, ceiling grid tiles and LED lights, new flooring and cove base, installation of televisions, installation of new student seating. So Phoebus High School um, is very unique. So it didn't have a defined cafeteria space. So what we wanted to do was make a defined cafeteria space. So in order to start that process, we had to do the removal of the uh, tile flooring. Uh, after that is done, we started with our upper and top plates and bottom plates to build the new uh, metal stud walls to define the cafeteria space. And as you can see here, the uh, wall studs are going up. All right, once the wall studs were done, we did the uh, drywall um, and finished uh, or finished in preparation for paint later. Once again, we used the fire rated panels here as well to help protect the space and give it a decorative feel. And then we started painting the new space. We also use wooden caps here um, around the perimeter of the cafeteria. And this was in preparation for the new storefront walls and windows. As you can see here, the metal uh, window frames and doors were installed with safety glass around the entire cafeteria. Then we moved on to the countertop brackets. And we did, uh, with the floors in the schools, they're, they're never really all level. So uh, we always wanna go in and do a uh, feather finish on top and then have that sanded down for the installation of the new floor tiles. So as you can see here, the new floor tiles are going down. Then we installed the new Corian countertops around the cafeteria walls. And the final transformation is cafeteria. As you can see, we did the installation of new waterfall tables and all metal seating. Uh, you can also see here, we use various uh, seating types. You know, we have round tables with the school's logos on it, uh, but you can see we totally updated the entire space, made it a defined space and made it an actual cafeteria. Uh, there's a picture of the uh, Phoebus High School logos on the table. Back to Mr. Malone. All right, next up at Phoebus High School was the fitness area. Uh, transform transformation of this environment uh, included removal of the broken and damaged equipment, removal of the oversized roll-up door and masonry work, painting, installation of new customized exercise flooring, customized agility turf, brand new customized fitness equipment, and a new space divider. Uh, first step was the demolition of the area. We had to remove the old flooring and the oversized roll-up door. Uh, we then went back and blocked up the door and added brand new oversized storefront windows. Uh, next step was painting. So the walls were scraped, sanded, and primed. Uh, the gym was then repainted in the original colors of Phoebus High School. Uh, the new fitness flooring is a Mondo rubberized exercise floor. And to prepare the floor for that, it had to be diamond ground and then added self-leveling concrete to make sure it was nice and level. Right. Then the concrete was sealed and the underlayment was glued on. And the installation of the flooring you can see uh, has customized Phoebus logos that are inset directly into the floor. And all the exercise equipment had to be assembled much like the cabinets uh, came in pieces. It was a custom design from the manufacturer. And the final transformation of the space you can see here, um, the agility turf, fresh paint and brand new windows new free weights and machines, new customized weight racks, customized bars and plates, and customized benches, all designed to give the space a, a college feel. Next up, Bettina. Thank you, Phil. The Phoebus High School Media Center transformation included removing old books and furniture, demolition of walls and ceiling grids, removing panel walls, construction of new study rooms, installation of new storefront doors, walls, and windows, new decorative ceilings and LED lightings, installation of new carpet, and installation of all new bookcases and furniture. We removed all the doors, panel walls, and old windows on both sides of the media center. We removed all of the ceiling structure and the old lighting 
Then we began building new metal stud walls to define the new media center layout. And we added finished drywalls to the metal, to the metal stud walls. A Phoebus High School's ceiling has an, a collaboration of architectural ceilings. Let's begin with the new tray ceiling, also known as a recessed ceiling. We installed on the left-hand side, you'll see the installation of the new framework. And on the right side, the drywall, and we ended up with um, new LED cam lights. In another area, we installed standard ceiling tiles. Here you see the rectangular ceiling tiles, I mean ceiling grids. And then we relocated the HVAC supply line for a good air circulation. And lastly, in the ceiling, we added a decorative ceiling grid. Here you see the different angles in the ceiling grid. And we installed customized ceiling tiles. Each tile had to be hand, kit, hand um, cut by hand. And not only did the installation, installation have to be um, noted that, you know, for the different angles, but it was a custom design with the three different colors here in the ceiling. LED lights was insulated according to light specifications. And new storefront walls and doors were added to define the six new study rooms. We added new decorative carpet to squares throughout the entire library space. And this is what it looks like once it was completed. New wooden door cases with metal shelves were installed along the perimeter of the media center, along with freestanding bookcases. A custom circulation desk was installed and wired with electrical service and networking. We added new soft seating options for students throughout the library. And each of the six study rooms has new meal tables, chairs, and integrated display, digital displays. In our final transformation here, you can see the soft seating um, in a round circular position. And here, the tables and chairs, you can note that they're put in um, small sections, but they are but they have casters, so they can be um, placed together for large, larger seating. In this final transformation, you can see the bookshelves along the perimeter, the freestanding bookshelves, the custom flooring, um, the circular seats, and the furniture. Okay, our next site uh, that we did transformations were Bethel High School. Transformation at this location at Bethel High School included uh, the building of a courtroom, uh, the building of a health science classroom and lab, renovation to the cafeteria, renovation to their auxiliary gym and a fitness area. And then we also did landscaping and outdoor seating. Next we'll have Mr. Coberly. All right, thank you, Dr. Bolin. So for transformation of this learning environment included the demolition of the existing space, construction of new walls, new electrical service, new storefronts, custom wall tile, new ceiling grid, tiles and LED lights, new flooring and code base, and then the installation of the furniture. So as you can see here, we did demolition and asbestos abatement of the classroom spaces. Uh, demolition and as, uh, asbestos abatement of the courtroom. A relocation of the HVAC return to the rear of the classroom. And then we moved on to the construction of the courtroom floor. So this room was kind of unique because it was sunken in and had several levels. So what we did is we used metal studs to raise the subfloor even with the rest of the courtroom area. After that process, we installed plywood over that uh, subfloor to elevate the sunken floor. Then we started our framing of the new courtroom and the classroom. Metal studs were installed to define the new learning spaces. New electrical service throughout the classroom and courtroom. And then the entire space was drywalled and finished. We also installed new ceiling grid throughout the spaces. We also did HVAC supply lines uh, to improve the air circulation within the space. And then we moved on to the new storefront uh, walls and doors, which were uh, installed in the classrooms and the study room areas. All right, then we moved on to our installation of the wall panel system. So as you can see here, the wall panel system's going in. 
and this custom wooden panel system installed throughout the entire courtroom area. So as you can see here, it's starting to look like a courtroom. Then we moved on to the installation of decorative flooring throughout the space. Here we are installing the uh, carpet squares. And this is what the final transformation of the courtroom looks like. As you can see the soft seating, here's the lit litigation area with uh, some soft seating and the final transformation of the courtroom seating. Here's one of the council chambers. And then this is the classroom space. As, as we said in the past, uh, the tables are all on casters. They can be moved around and put it in any shape or form as needed. Okay, next up, we have our health science classroom and lab. Transformation of this learning environment included demolition of existing space, renovation of a restroom, new cabinets and sink, new ceiling grid tiles and LED lights, painting of the space, installation of new flooring and code base, and installation of new furniture and Promethean boards. This space began its life as a home, old home economics room. It had tons of cabinets and sink and appliances. So it was a heavy demolition area. Uh, we removed all the old cabinets. We took down block walls. We had to rip out the electrical. We had to dig out the gas lines that were running through the floor. And unfortunately, to the tile that was down was asbestos, so we did have to have that professionally abated uh, and the mastic taken up as well. We also took a look at the restroom that was inside of the uh, space, and that was very old and needed to be renovated. So we tore out the plumbing, uh, we reworked the electrical, we took out all of the old fixtures. And of course, then we went back in with a new tile that you can see here. We redid the plumbing, we put in a new lights, we put in a new drop ceiling. We also put in um, new bathroom fixtures, as you can see here, and we have a beautiful updated restroom. Next, we saw cut the block, uh, both to the entrance to the restroom and then also to uh, the classroom as well to make sure that it was ADA require our uh, met ADA requirements because uh, as part of that help program they'll be transporting patients in and out of rooms and wheelchairs and we wanted to make sure they, they could practice those skills. Uh, as it was stated earlier, no floors ever level in these buildings. They undulate up and down. They have low and high spots. So to help compensate for that, uh, we pour the we pour a light feather finish or a lightweight cement product over top of the floors. We have to grind those down so that they're level. And then you can see where we're putting the glue down in preparation for the new tile floor that went in, Bethel Green. Uh, here for Bethel. Uh, you can also see that we did a nice new pattern there. We're trying to get away from that old monochromatic look, but this gives it a nice hospital look as this is a health science room. We also said that was a lab area and what you're seeing here now is again green carpet for Bethel, but also uh, this is our instructional area. So it gives a nice division between those two spaces. Next, we put in two Promethean boards, one in the instructional area, and then one also in the lab area that you can see here. Nice thing about these two boards is they can be interlinked together to show the same thing or separated to show two different things or two different assignments in the classroom. Also in the lab area, we put in uh, new cabinets, countertops, sink, and faucet. We added 18 new tables and 36 new chairs. As Mr. Coberly said earlier, uh, we tried to go with the theme of putting everything on casters because we're going for 21st century spaces and we don't want things to be locked in and can't be adapted. Uh, we want learning spaces to be adaptable so that when that instructor decides or she decides they want to do something different, small group activities, or maybe they're doing CPR or something, those chairs and tables can be easily rearranged very quickly. So this is our final transformation. As you can see here, the whiteboards, touchscreen, Promethean boards of our instructional area. And here's the final transformation of our medical area where students can practice all of those latest medical techniques and learn about how to take care of patients. All right, next up at Bethel High School is the cafeteria. Uh, transformation of this environment included removing the old cafeteria tables, installation of new wall tile, painting the space, installation of new televisions, and brand new student seating options. Uh, first step was to remove the old cafeteria tables, the concrete shelf, the old electrical, um, the old clocks, and the PA system. Uh, then we had to remove the water fountains which included more than just taking them off the wall. We had to move the electrical, the water supply, and the drain lines. Uh, the existing cafeteria tile had to be repaired and patched and then coated with a specialized primer. 
Those old tiles were then covered up with brand new ceramic tiles around the entire space. And we went through and painted and patched all the walls, installed five brand new 65 inch HD TVs, and added brand new custom tables and chairs for a variety of seating options, uh, including waterfall tables installed in school colors, upgraded trash receptacles and logo tables placed around the cafeteria, and the final transformation of the space, you can see the brand new ceramic tile all along the wall. You can see the brand new round tables with school logos. Uh, you can see the waterfall tables, the metal chairs, and the new trash receptacles. Brand new TVs and LED lights. And gives the, the students lots of seating options and gives it a more modern feel. So we'll be team. Thank you. The transformation of the auxiliary gymnasium, gymnasium and fitness area includes removing of the old flooring, painting of the entire space, upgrading to LED lights, installation of new basketball goals, new customized flooring, new doors, installation of new customized fitness equipment, and new scoreboard. We began by the removal of all the old equipment and flooring. We painted the entire gymnasium, ceilings and walls. We painted the ceilings a bright white, and we used the school's colors along the walls. We removed all the old lighting and replaced it with new LED lights. In the exercise area, we installed a customized exercise flooring with um, customized inlaid inlays, which included the um, school's logos. We also installed an agility training turf. And in the rest of the gym, a Mondo gym flooring was installed. Exercise equipment was installed, a variation of exercise equipment. Here you can see the weights and dumbbells. And all the equipment was customized with either the students, I mean, I'm sorry, the school's name and mascot. We also received new basketball goals. Thank you. Okay, our next transformation area was Kikatan High School. At Kikatan High School, we built a bank, an entrepreneurial classroom and lab. Uh, we renovated the media center. We renovated their cafeteria. Uh, we renovated their auxiliary gym and fitness areas. Uh, we also conducted phase one storefront window upgrades and we did landscaping and outdoor seating. All right, so we're gonna move on to the bank. Uh, we did the installation of new stud walls, installation of electrical, drywall and paint, uh, walls and doors, ceiling grid, tile and LED lights, new counters and countertops, installation of new floor tile, and the installation of Promethean board and furniture. So this space at Kikatan High School is in the cafeteria. It was the old scullery. And what we did is we did a dem uh, demolition of that space and actually used metal studs to build the walls and ceiling components of the new bank. Then we moved on to the electrical installation. After that, we did drywall. Uh, we taped and mud it and sand it and paint it. Then we did the new storefront walls and doors were in, uh, installed to the interior and exterior of the space. We went with a uh, new uh, metal ceiling grid installed, HVAC air supply lines and return registers are connected. New decorative LED lights and ceiling tiles installed throughout the entire space. And then we moved on to the bank teller stations and they were custom built and wired with electrical and network cables. Countertops were installed at the teller stations in the conference room and the accounting space. We did the decorative floor tile installed in the uh, Kikatan High School and Bayport uh, bank colors. We did a uh, decorative uh, fire rated panel installed with a wireless touchscreen Promethean board. And all of the teller stations were ADA compliant. We moved on to the conference and training space that allows for student education, client meetings and employee training. And for the final transformation of this, this is the waiting area. 
and a view from the cafeteria and another view from the cafeteria as well. All right. Our next space was our entrepreneurial classroom and lab. A transformation of this learning environment include demolition of the existing space, removal of a load bearing wall, removal of old room ventilators, uh, installation of new storefront walls, installation of new flooring, new Promethean boards and televisions, and uh, installation of new furniture. Uh, this started out as three separate classrooms that we had decided we're going to go together to make this new space. And of course, the first thing that we had to do was remove the old storefront and some of the old furniture. We had to disconnect some electrical poles and disconnect some water lines that were running through that space. Next, to build those spaces or connect those spaces together and create that open concept that we we're going for, we had to take a sledgehammer and start going at the walls and knocking down the cinder block walls that you can see in both of these pictures to um, that uh, join these spaces together. Um, what ended up happening is that one of those walls, and we knew that before, was a load bearing wall. So we had to work with a structural engineer and an architect uh, to come up with a new uh, metal support system that could be put into place there and uh, carry that new load while still maintaining that open concept. We also removed eight room ventilators, and these were actually in what we call the chiller and boiler loop. That means water was running through them, so we had to disconnect those pipes, drain that loop out, and then reconnect those pipes so it could feed hot and cold water for heating and cooling to the rest of the building, while allowing us to move those old, if you will, like old radiators. What did that actually help us do? Well, it helped us to create a nice wall surface that we could go in and begin to fur out. As you can see, us putting the metal studs along here. And that allowed us to, uh, to run all of our new electrical. Of course, we drywalled after that. We mudded, sanded, and painted. Next, we put in our ceiling grid that you can see here. We also connected uh, and re reduct our HVAC system to have better airflow through that system. We our new LED lights and of course our ceiling tiles there and on the right hand picture you can see what that looks like. After that we started to put in our cabinets uh, both uppers and lowers and the different sections throughout that new room space and we also put fire rated panels in as well. We also use storefront uh, to help divide the space up, uh, not to close it back off because the storefront, of course, is clear glass and we can see through, but it helps to find certain spaces for certain purposes within that room. Once we had that up, we also put down new flooring. You can see that some different options of flooring that we put in in different areas. And here's the final transformation of one of the two boardrooms that we put in. Again, you can see how the storefront defines the space, but yet you can see into it so it doesn't close at all. This would be the inside where students would go in and present uh, their business plans or ideas of like Shark Tank, if you will. Um, they could do it to uh, potential investors. Here's a picture of the classroom looking from the back forward. You can see the new whiteboards and Promethean boards. Again, everything's on casters, so you can roll it around. You can keep it in a traditional instructional setup as this, or you can move it into small groups or depending on what the instructor would like to do. Here's a picture from the front of the room looking back. You can see the two boardrooms in the back. Remember I said this was three classrooms. So this is one of two lab areas that we have here. This is the uh, production lab. So the idea as an entrepreneur is you have to have a product that you're going to sell. This is where they would do their research and development on certain products. Here's another example of that wall, how we separate one lab area from the next, but yet it still allows that open feel. And this, of course, is your marketing area lab, uh, because once you have a product, of course, you have to be able to sell it. You need to be able to package it, do advertising and all of those different types of business products to get it out to market. Okay, next up, we have our media center. All right, also kick it in. Uh, we remodeled the media center. Transformation of this environment included the demolition of the space, the relocation of the server room, installation of new study rooms and new HVAC systems, new custom designed ceiling grids, tiles, and LED lights, new storefront windows and walls, and installation of new flooring, uh, and brand new bookcases and furniture. Uh, first step was to remove the books, the old furniture, the lights, and the old wooden storefronts. Uh, we then moved the, the server room to re relocate it and make room for a study room. Uh, we then framed and drywalled the existing spaces to meet our current, our future needs. Uh, upgraded the HVAC system in these spaces to provide better airflow and comfort. Added a brand new custom ceiling grid with brand new tiles and LED lights. 
added brand new storefronts, walls, windows, and doors in the space. Uh, installed a brand new decorative acoustic ceiling tile system. Uh, removed the old, corp the old carpet and sealed the floor to prevent moisture intrusion. And installed brand new carpet and brand new shelving units. Uh, also a uh, brand new circulation desk and mobile shelving units. And the final transformation here is the shot of one of the study rooms includes one of the new Mio tables with network and electric cables. And again, you can see all the furniture here is set up to be movable. So individual study groups or large study groups can be uh, achieved just by moving the tables. New soft seating options for the students and the new storefronts. And the brand new bookshelves and I'll look at the study rooms from the side of the library. Now the transformation for Kikatan's auxiliary gym and fitness area included installation of new storefront windows, removal of old equipment and, and fencing, removal of old exercise equipment and gymnasium flooring, installation of new HVAC, painting of ceiling and walls, the extensive floor preparation, installation of new custom flooring and new exercise equipment. Unlike Bethel's gym, we had to remove all of the old single pane windows at Kikatan and replace with new energy efficient storefront windows. We removed all of the old equipment and the fencing that surrounded it. We removed all the um, flooring in the weight area and the remainder of the gym. We added new HVAC to the area, which did not have before. And to prep for painting, we scraped, patched, and primed. We added the new bright white to the ceiling and used the school's colors along the walls. This floor was in terrible condition as many of the other flooring. So we brought in the um, diamond grinder on the left-hand side, you'll see where we had to grind out the floor. We leveled it off. And then we um, sealed the floor to prevent moisture intrusion. New Mondo rubberized flooring was cut, fitted, and glued into place. And this is what it looks like once it was laid. New customized fitness equipment came in and a variety of different equipment to um, for different levels of fitness and weight training. And here in the final transformation, you can see the customized fitness equipment with the school's name and logos, the rubberized flooring and the customized inlays. Okay, our last transformation site tonight uh, is Hampton High School. At Hampton High School, uh, we worked on their science classrooms as well. Uh, we renovated their cafeteria, we created new, two new classroom spaces, and we created a brand new fitness area that was not there before. Uh, and we also conducted landscaping and we did outdoor seating. So next up, we'll have Mr. Coberly. All right, so I'm going to do the science classrooms here. And uh, transformation of this learning environment included the removal of the old furniture and built-in cabinetry, disconnection of the utilities, extensive asbestos abatement, installation of new decorative flooring, installation of new ceiling grid tiles and LED lights, installation of cabinets and countertops, installation of new Promethean boards and furniture. So to start this space, we had to do the removal of all the old furniture and the built-in cabinetry. So as you can see in these two photographs here, everything has been removed except for the debris. Then we moved on to the disconnection of the electrical plumbing and the natural gas. Once that was done, we hired a professional company to come in and do extensive asbestos abatement in this building. And that uh, removal of the asbestos containing plaster, ceilings, floor tiles, and the mastic in the spaces. Once that was done, once again, floor preparation, we did a feather finish and, and sanding and then a moisture sealing of the floor. Then we moved on to the installation of new ceiling tiles, LED lights, speakers, and Wi-Fi antennas. Once that was done, we moved on to the installation of the new upper cabinets in all of the classrooms. And then we did extensive plumbing, electrical, and natural gas. 
um, in these rooms as well. We had to move a lot of stuff around and reconfigure things for the sinks. So as you can see here, the plumbing, electrical and stuff was going in place. Then we moved on to the custom floor tile. Uh, the picture on the left shows that after it's done, the picture on the right is once it's waxed and cleaned. Then we did the installation of lower cabinets. Lower cabinets were installed with the chemical resistant countertops and sinks. And then we moved on to our lab stations. Each of these lab stations has installed plumbing, electrical, and natural gas connections. So this is our final transformation. This is the uh, prep room and they share prep rooms. So as you can see here, new appliances and new plumbing and new cabinetry to lock things up. Uh, this is a classroom space here with all the new cabinets and countertops in place, the bulletin boards, lights and ceilings and furniture. Here's another shot of the room. We also did custom uh, oak uh, paneling, as you can see above and below the windows to match the uh, doors in the space. And each of the classrooms gets the uh, whiteboards and a touchscreen Promethean board as well. We also worked with the cafe cafeteria at Hampton High School, and that involved the uh, removing of the old tables and water fountains, installation of new walls, installation of new ceramic tiles, new bottle fill of water fountains, and custom tables and seats, and also new 65-inch high-definition televisions. Uh, first, of course, as always, we had to remove the old furniture that was there. These tables were um, 35, almost 40 years old. We definitely got our money's worth out of them. Uh, they were non-operational, and it was quite a job to get them out of the cafeteria. We also removed the water fountain, as you can see on your right. It's not just a matter, as Phil said earlier, of just taking it off the wall. Um, but once it gets off the wall, you have to get to the, uh, the plumbing that's there. So we have to get to the water supply, the drains, the electric. All of that has to be reworked to put those nice brand new bottle fill of water fountains in. Also, the cafeteria um, at Hampton High School was uh, interesting in its wall design. Uh, we knew where we wanted to go with that with the ceramic tiles. In order to accommodate that, we had to build a pony wall system that you can see here uh, through much of the uh, cafeteria area. Then that allowed us to go back with a cement board over top of that uh, why would we do that? Because that gives us a nice flat, even surface around the entire cafeteria. Uh, we were able to prime the surface and then install our decorative tile, which helps to dress up that cafeteria and bring it into the 21st century. Uh, next, after that, uh, you can see that we brought in the new customized furniture and seating that you can see here. Lots of different seating options. I uh, hear you waterfall tables, you have tall ones and short ones. The chairs are all made of aluminum of metal construction. Uh, you get regular tables that you can see here. Uh, we also had a, a number of different seating options. You have your logo tables uh, with your Hampton Crabbers on it. Uh, you have your high top tables against the wall. And of course the back wall, you can see one of the four 65 inch high definition TVs that we installed. And these TVs are wonderful because they can advertise different advertisements uh, that the school may have testing that's coming up, uh, happy birthdays to students, um, uh, inspirational messages, they can show the games or they can even teach from them with the use of an app. All right, next up at Hampton High School was the creation of new classrooms. Uh, this included removal of the old equipment and debris removal of the wall and floor coverings of the existing spaces, interior and exterior masonry work, installation of new HVAC, installation of new flooring, installation of new whiteboards and Promethean boards, and brand new classroom furniture. Uh, first, we had to empty the areas of debris and old materials. Then remove the coverings for the ceilings and floors. Uh, then had to go in and block up the doorway that was between the two spaces. Uh, we also added windows to have some natural lighting in the new classrooms. Installed brand new HVAC system to each one of the rooms. A brand new ceiling grid and ceiling tiles. Uh, the concrete floors were then sealed to prevent moisture. Added that brand new decorative floor tile throughout both rooms. Added new touchscreen Promethean boards, whiteboards, and bulletin boards to each space. And the final transformation, here's the classroom, as you can see with the whiteboards and the brand new furniture. And here's the second room uh, with the new touchscreen Promethean boards and bulletin boards on the sidewall. 
Next up will be Tina. Thank you, Phil. We also created a new fitness area and the transformation of that area includes extensive demolition of the old boiler room, extensive interior and exterior masonry work, installation of new storefront windows, installation of new HVAC, new ceiling grids, tiles and LED lights, installation of customized custom exercise flooring, new custom exercise equipment. Now the old boiler room had to be cleared of all the old mechanical equipment. Here you see our team hard at work. The extensive demolition was required for the repurpose of this space, which included the removal of two large boilers, a hot water tank, two concrete pads, and you can see one here lower, just how thick that pad was, and a, and a massive amount of piping. This demo took over two weeks. Here you can see in this um, photo, after all of that mechanical work, mechanicals was demoed and removed, but we had to cut a hole into this block wall so that students can gain access to the main building. And this is a view from the hallway looking into the old boiler room and from the boiler room looking into the hallway. New masonry block walls was constructed to separate the electrical utilities and new windows. On the left-hand side here, you can see the new masonry block, which separates the electrical utilities. And on the right-hand side here, what we originally had was a set of three large 10-foot metal double doors. We removed those double doors. Then we began um, from the ground up, installing block about 52 inches. We covered that block up with um, brick that was complementary to the uh, original school's exterior brick. That was in preparation for the new insulated storefront windows. Here you can see the storefront windows and the new brick. We had a new HVAC system, which was installed with fresh air, take, fresh air intakes. Decorative painting throughout the space, in which we utilize the school colors. You can see here the installation of the new ceiling grid, tiles, and LED lights. And then we installed new exercise flooring with customized inset logos. This is what it looks like after the floor was installed, the inset logos, and a new um, Agility training turf was also installed. Um, exercise equipment came in, which had to be put together. And this is what it looks like with, after it's been put together, you can see your uh, weights and your dumbbells. Here we have a variety of different exercise equipment to be used for different uh, training levels and the new customized agility turf. This final transformation picture here shows it all. We have the new ceiling tiles, new LED lights, X, um, the new HVAC. Here's the door that had to be cut in so students can access the main building. A new flooring with the customized turf, the customized inlets, and the agility turf. Go Crabbers. Okay. Well, on behalf of the operations and maintenance department, we would like to thank you uh, for your attention tonight. And there will also be a supplemental report that will be going in. I will get that to Dr. Smith and Dr. Smith will uh, forward that to board members uh, with additional projects. That's about another hundred slides. So I didn't want to put that in there tonight. Um, so we'll give that to you separately and that will cover many, many more projects that we covered this summer. And at this time, I'll go ahead and open it up to comments and questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowling. Uh, great presentation. Actually, that last slide's the best because those are the people that put in all the work. Um, so I'll open it up to uh, the board members. Uh, if do I have any comments or question from board members? You're gonna have to speak up because I can only see a few faces on the screen. 
Shall we go back to uh, gallery view? No comments, questions? All right. Well, again, thank you very much, Dr. Bowling and, and the other presenters. It was a great presentation. I will say that, um, you know, city council members did take a, a tour of some of our high schools and they were, they were just blown away, very impressed. Um, and I know as board members, we are very proud uh, that we show our city council how well we, uh, we spend the money that they give us. And uh, I personally am very impressed with the trades and the craftsmen that did this work. It is just top notch. So I think it's, it's great and I, I really appreciate your efforts. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, I think Ms. Uh, Cherry. Um, yes, Ms. Cherry. Yes, I was trying to unmute. Um, this was just fantastic. I, I know the council members took a tour and I know you had led one as well, Mr. Kilgore, but I just wanted you to know that I've heard so many wonderful comments. In fact, the first person to call me about it was Catherine Glass. And I'm sure she won't mind me um, expressing some of her um, comments, but she was just blown away because what our people, our staff, and that department has done is amazing. I can't think of anybody going into any of our schools and not immediately feeling pride. I was just sitting here saying, I'm going to download several pictures, especially of Bethel, where my daughter graduated from a just center and say, look how it looks now, because it is just fantastic. They are, as you said, top notch. I can't think of a, a better word for it. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cherry. Yes, Mr. Carnack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a few questions on the presentation, uh, namely relating to the media centers and uh, it, in addition, some maybe some future capital projects. So I heard in the Bethel portion of the presentation that uh, there was one space that was specifically redesigned with respect to ADA compliance. And I was wondering, uh, because uh, in, in Hampton High School specifically, just switching gears, there is a lack of elevator access between the first and second floors. Is that a uh, future capital project idea to install some kind of elevator in Hampton High School in the main part uh, to make that ADA compliant? Yes, Ms. Karnak, it uh, certainly is. We've taken a look at that and, um, and gotten some prices uh, and we'll have to get the plans drawn up by an architect uh, in order to add that, but that definitely is uh, on the horizon for us. Okay, I appreciate that. And then uh, just some, just a few more questions. Uh, so are there uh, currently plans to renovate the library media centers at um, Hampton and Bethel in addition to those that have already been done at Kikatan and Phoebus? Yes, absolutely. That will be the phase two. We just couldn't fit it all in this summer. So those are on okay. the, the table for next summer. All right, I appreciate that. Uh, it's good to know that those things are definitely on the table and being implemented. Thank you. Okay, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Carnack. Okay, Dr. Smith. Okay, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, that really concludes superintendent and uh, staff reports. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. We now move on to section five of our meeting hearing of any uh, delegations or presentations of any written communications or petitions. I believe we have uh, two, two folks that submitted something in writing and Ms. Bowers, you're, you have recorded those and are gonna play those for us. Yes. All right. This is public comment from Debbie Varney, residing at 5006 Hillsboro Court, Hampton. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been very impressed with the conduct and dedication of the faculty and staff at HCS during this pandemic. Everyone is to be commended for the long hours and hard work to make everything happen so smoothly. There will always be hiccups, but even then, it seems that things are quickly reviewed and remedied. As a parent, I thank you all. 
from my perspective and logic, it doesn't make sense to start back in person right at the beginning of flu season and before holiday get togethers. It seems counterintuitive to me. I would like my students to start back on January the 4th in the classroom because it makes more sense. Doing so gives three days after the holidays to detect if a child is ill and shouldn't attend school in person. It also gives our community time to see if there will be a new wave of COVID-19 during the beginning of the flu season. Thank you for asking for input, listening, and your consideration on this issue. This is public comment from Shelley Matthews, residing at 2914 Matoka Road in Hampton. Good afternoon. I'm writing this letter to service documentation that I am in full agreement with sending our students back to in-person schooling. I am the mother of twin girls that attend Spratly Gifted Center as new sixth graders. They are doing well academically and have caught on quickly with all this new technology. However, my husband and myself have to tutor them in the evening, sometimes until nine or 10 o'clock at night, due to them having limited time with their teachers. We both work full-time jobs, so this puts a huge strain on our family. They are receiving the majority of their learning from alternative websites like IXL, Canvas, StudySync, WellNet, and others. We feel they would be better able to excel if they were in front of a teacher and had that face-to-face -face instruction. Also, they both are missing the social aspect of school and miss their friends terribly. I also have a third grader at Armstrong Elementary School. His teachers have been amazing through all of this, but he struggles with paying attention and getting through three plus hours a day of learning on a computer. And due to me teleworking and working in the office, I cannot sit on top of him constantly. Instead, I work with him in the evenings for almost two hours nightly to make sure he is getting the concepts and retaining information. He was an AB student last year and loved school. This year he does well with the work I help him with, but he isn't getting enough actual instruction to help him learn. He is eight. He needs to be in the classroom learning with his peers and being redirected by his teacher. For example, he took his district math test this week and got a two out of 15. He knows that material, but being isolated and sent to a website to take a test is not working. Full-time working parents are struggling. Hampton has not offered any help with any day camp options for families, like something through SAP. SAP is just offering a virtual program and what child wants to do something else on the computer when they have been on the computer all day doing schoolwork. And virtual does not help with supervision needs. Working parents need help. We need options for our children. Newport News has offered three plus options for their children through the YMCA, Parks and Rec, and the Boys and Girls Club. Why hasn't Hampton helped? I am confident that HCS has adequately prepared for our children to return to face-to-face -face learning. At the previous school board meeting, Dr. Smith explained that we have met, even exceeded all the metrics that we had to meet before allowing face-to-face -face instruction. And when we returned in September, it was said that we would stay virtual for the first nine weeks unless conditions improved. We have to remember that part. Conditions in Hampton have improved. So let's start phasing our children back in. Thank you. And that completes our public comment. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. We now move on to deliberation and uh, I will read, um, I'll just go through them very quickly uh, and ask if there's any uh, deliberative comments. Revision of school board policy GBA equal opportunity employment. Any comments? All right. Policy GCDA effective criminal convictions or founded complaint of child abuse and neglect. Any comments? All right. Policy GDH, support personnel grievances. All right. Policy GCPD, dismissal of the personnel. Comments? And then uh, final policy, policy GCG, certified employees, probation and contractual status. 
all right? Uh, those policies will be moved to action at our next meeting. And now we get to the part that I know you're all very excited to hear. My annual going over of the Virginia School Board Association uh, legislative positions of their legislative policy committee. Um, and I know I sent this to you in advance to take a look at. What I will do is, is read through these uh, quickly so citizens will uh, understand uh, what the Virginia School Board Association uh, Delegate Assembly will be addressing. Uh, and for uh, the citizens information, the Virginia School Board Association does employ a lobbyist uh, that lobbies at the General Assembly for uh, school related uh, legislation that benefits the school divisions. So, um, and then I will, after each one, what I'm really looking for is any feedback one way or the other from the board on how they feel about these policies. So collectively, when I go to the assembly, I am representing Hampton City School Board. There are six legislative positions this year. Uh, four of them are amended, two are new. Uh, and as you're aware, uh, legislative positions from prior years stay on the books and are lobbied for, uh, and they only come off if legislation is passed or if it's overcome by events. So, so the first one is behavioral intervention, interventionist as support positions. It's a new legislative position, and it reads the VSBA supports the addition of behavioral interventionist as a standard of quality position to reinforce and complement the work of school counselors in the Commonwealth's elementary classrooms. This position would assist in achieving a workable ratio between students and mental health providers. Behavioral interventionists will serve the immediate needs of a child or children in crisis, consult with the school counselor, and intervene in the classroom setting to assist in maintaining the learning environment to provide academic achievement for all students. Each local division will determine their individual need for behavioral interventionist positions at a ratio to be determined by the General, General Assembly. Uh, this came from Culpeper County and it was introduced, um, the position, uh, they actually introduced it uh, two years ago in their school division um, because they were experiencing a number of students whose behaviors would be described as uncontrollable. Uh, and the counselors were involved with small groups and things like that. So it, it gave them a resource um, to have individualized support. Um, and one of the things that I noticed that was interesting in the rationale, it says, if the General Assembly continues along the path to reduce counselor to student ratio, our districts will all need to hire additional counselors, which is true. We were on the path to do that before the pandemic. We know the problem that there is, that is there are not enough counselors to fill uh, all of the open positions that will be in the Commonwealth. That's their position. I don't, I don't have any data behind that. Um, but the position of a behavioral interventionist could, be, could fill our needs, support our students and counselors, as well as assist with families, engagement, and positive school community relationships. Um, Mr. Samuels had asked a question about this. This is currently not a um, standards of quality position. So it is not funded by the state right now. If the state if the General Assembly was to decide to make this position, a behavioral interventionist position, an SOQ position, then it would come with funding for SOQ positions, just like all of them. And they usually, they set the bar at a, a fairly low rate uh, as far as how many, how many positions you have per student. Again, this is uh, specifically addressing elementary schools. So, um, so do I have any questions? Yes, Mr. Samuels. 
Yes, Joe, and thank you so much for you know um, um, sharing that you and I had a conversation regarding the the funding. Uh, um, um, question I had as it relates to funding. And so, you know, since there has been a decline in the state revenue, I'm assuming that, you know, this potentially could not even be on the, 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 the Virginia, um, the, the delegates um, um, agenda, uh, because there are other priorities that needs to be looked at. And, um, and I also want to uh, ask Dr. Smith, I know we have an agreement and I'm just talking about us locally. I know we have an agreement with Community Services Board to offer um, some intervention and, and support to our um, staff that are in the school. So Dr. Smith, on that ledger, how does that um, change um, this, the work of Community Services Board? Uh, it would really just add um, additional value and uh, support on the front end. Okay. So it would complement. So it, it would complement what Community Services Board is currently doing. And this, but, but my position, John, I'm just going to be quite frank, um, since that we're in a decline um, in state revenue and, and, and so forth, um, I think we need to stay focused on the, what the, the 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 governor's budget proposal was and giving teacher a raise. And so I will not be in full support of this at this particular moment until there's some change in uh, our increase in the state revenue. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, I think that's all accurate is that uh, it is very unlikely that the General Assembly would take up something like this, given the financial uh, issues that they're going to have. What this would do is say, the, the General Assembly went to great effort to say, here are SOQ funded positions. So they can have that conversation. This would only come to roost on our doorstep, one, if they, if they passed legislation that funded it, and, develop, and established it as an SOQ, or two, if we like Culpepper decided that we wanted to do this just like we do so many positions where we, we establish positions above SOQ levels. So this is not an SOQ position at all. Culpepper went out and, and got seven of these folks for their six elementary schools. Um, and and did that on their own expense. We do similar things in Hampton above and beyond the SOQ funded positions. We just don't do this particular one. So, any other comments from board members? All right. Thank you. All right. Um, the second uh, proposal is an amended proposal, and I'll just read the first part and highlight what was amended. Um, the original position said the VSBA supports the establishment of a balanced assessment and accountability system as defined by local school boards that utilizes a more complete picture of student learning by providing both measures of achievement, such as standards of learning, SOL test, and state approved authentic measures, measures of individualized student growth over time. Furthermore, the VSBA supports a reduction in the number of SOL tests to carefully selected grade levels and content areas to permit the reallocation of assessment dollars and the instructional time. And the new amended word that they are adding is the VSBA Board of the, the Virginia School Board Association also supports a comprehensive review of state content standards, curriculum guidelines, and assessments to ensure state policies promote culturally responsive educational practices free of systemic racism, discrimination, and background knowledge based bias or biases. 
Uh, this was proposed by Fairfax County, the rationale being that the Virginia School Board, uh, the Virginia Board Department of Education conducts bias reviews as part of its normal test development process, but has not looked at the issue more systemically across curriculum materials. And again, this was voted on by the Legislative Policy Committee and uh, had a vote of nine to zero. Any comments about that position? Sounds pretty reasonable. All right, I'll move on to number three. Uh, this uh, position is called the affordability of dual enrollment and it's an amended position. Uh, it says the Virginia School Board Association supports making dual enrollment affordable for eligible students, no matter where or how, or how being amended, instruction takes place and allows local school boards and community colleges to collaborate in establishing tuition for these students. In a new sentence that they added, the Virginia School Board Association opposes a mandatory tuition floor on dual enrollment courses. Um, this is the rationale. It came from, again, Fairfax County. Um, it clarifies existing position allowing school divisions and ins institutions of higher education to determine its own tuition structure for dual enrollment courses and clarifies the mode of instruction, i.e. face-to-face, hybrid, online, and should not be or should not matter to cost structure discussions. Again, that was passed by the legislative uh, positions committee by a vote of nine to zero. Any comments on that? Yes, Mr. Karnak. So um, just enough from, a, from our perspective, are we not already doing an affordable uh, tuition structure for dual enrollment classes? Yes, these are positions that the Virginia School Board Association will advocate for for the 132 divisions across the Commonwealth. Okay. So where we may be doing it, other divisions may be challenged with uh, some of the structure of their dual enrollment programs. So we're really ahead of the eight ball on this one is what I'm hearing. We do well at just about everything. Okay, uh, the fourth legislative position is an amended one. And again, it, it addresses volunteers. And it's a, I think it's a very interesting one. Um, the VSBA, and this is existing word, the VSBA believes that programs to promote volunteerism and reward and retain volunteers should be developed throughout the Commonwealth. In this period of limited resources, the services provided by volunteers are essential. The value of volunteerism is especially noticeable in many public school systems in the state. Volunteers perform, perform services in the schools which would have, have to be provided otherwise by the government. At the same time that many schools and localities have a greater need for the services of volunteers, many forces serve as a deterrent to volunteering, such as the need for full-time employment and the decrease in the number of adults with social or school-age children. To offset factors which diminish and discourage volunteerism, plans which encourage voluntary participation, such as tax incentives, recruitment and training programs, recognition and reward ceremonies should be established throughout the state. That's the existing wording. The new wording that they want that are that they're proposing to add is in an attempt to increase the pool of individuals who may apply as a volunteer, school divisions in the Commonwealth of Virginia should consider applicants on a case-by-case -case basis who have a felony conviction, but who have fulfilled their legal commitment to society. The application process would consider the type of crime committed, the duration of time since conviction, and the volunteer role being requested. This action would address the inequities 
in the candidate volunteer pool of men of color in particular and provide a group of volunteers of all ethnicities and genders who would be good mentors for the students at high risk in our schools. And I'll read the rationale behind this one because it's powerful. The United States has 5% of the world's population, yet approximately 25% of its prisoners. More than 60% of the people in prison are people of color. For black males in their 20s, one in every eight is in prison or jail or on any given day. This inequity is a problem being actively discussed in our country now, but many school divisions continue to perpetuate this problem by denying individuals with a history of felony convictions the option to apply as a volunteer in schools. The Lynch Board City School Board has enacted a formal process to screen applicants with felony convictions that excludes individuals who have a history of crime against children or violent crime with final determinations made by the superintendent. We recognize that the safety of the children in our schools is the primary responsibility of our board, but we, are all, we also believe this policy promotes equity in our volunteer pool and demonstrates appropriate respect to all individuals who desire to help our students succeed. Again, this was proposed by Lynchburg Schools and the Legislative Positions Committee voted nine to zero to approve it. Do I have any comments or questions? Yes, Ms. Cherry. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I applaud the intent of the, that proposal. The only question I have, and I'm thinking back anecdotally with Hampton City Schools, in the past when, when I was PR director and worked very closely with the HR director, one of the problems we had was people who wanted to volunteer had to have a background check. And we had people coming from the faith-based um, institutions who wanted to volunteer in our schools but because not so much that they had to have a background check, the problem became who pays for the background check. And we had some issues because you had people wanted to volunteer and they said, but I've got to pay to volunteer. So I would just caution that if we as a division get involved in that, that we have some clear cut rules and dynamics that speak to who's going to pay for the background check because they're not cheap and it almost seems inappropriate that someone wants to give their time, but then they have to come out of their pocket and pay for a background check. Thank you, Ms. Cherry. And I will add that uh, Mr. Samuels also asked me to look into uh, what policies this would affect uh, for Hampton City Schools and uh, looking through it. And again, other people will have to confirm this, but it, it appeared that we have two policies that address volunteers. We have policy GE, which is uh, athletics and co-curricular volunteers. We also have policy GEA, which is volunteers in the schools. And although I'm not sure that if they pass legislation, that it would that it would necessarily impact the wording of those policies, those policies may have to um, reference those legal uh, codes but it wouldn't necessarily change the wording. I think the issue of paying for a background check is probably a completely independent issue because you're talking about the entire volunteer pool when you talk about paying for background checks. This just talks about legislation that would increase this, potentially increase the size of the pool. Okay. Any other comments? All right, um, moving on to uh, legislation position number five. Again, this is a brand new one, but it's short, so I'll read through it. It's access to electronic textbooks and adequate connectivity. Um, and I, it's a timely one. The VSBA supports bills that promote access to electronic textbooks and adequate connectivity as follows. A. 
It should be the policy of the Commonwealth that all textbooks approved by the board for use in grades six through 12 shall be equally accessible to all students at schools and in their residence. B, by July 1st, 2022, every household in the Commonwealth shall have access to fixed broadband or wireless broadband connection service with unlimited data allowances and speeds of at least 10 megabytes per second download or three megabytes per second upload. C, the Commonwealth should provide funding on a per pupil basis to the local school board for any student eligible for free or reduced meals to be provided free or reduced price data access accordingly. This was proposed by Prince William County. Uh, their rationale was the use of interactive textbooks is now prevalent throughout Virginia school divisions. Nevertheless, internet service is still not available to many households, both in rural areas and geographic pockets within more populated regions. As a result, all students are not able to benefit from the use of some of the latest education technology. And this was uh, approved by the Legislative Positions Committee by a nine to zero vote. Any questions, comments? I really appreciate the really uh, clear language that's set out in that uh, legislative position because really in this pandemic, when we're moving to virtual learning, we're seeing that the digital divide is becoming more apparent than ever. And we really need to have that strong wording that says every child has access to that broadband internet connection and that access to data. I, I really applaud this one. Thank you, Mr. Carney. And I know you're disappointed, but this is the final legislative position. Look at all those sad faces there. Um, so uh, the sixth position is an amended one. It is uh, 21st century communication for school boards. And this is as a direct result of the pandemic. The current wording in the position says, when a quorum of a public body is physically assembled at one location for the purpose of conducting a meeting, additional members of such public body may participate in the meeting through telephonic or video means provided such participation may be heard by the public as authorized under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. A quorum may be accounted for via an electronic roll call. The newly added wording to this position is, the VSBA supports changes to Virginia's law to allow local school boards to conduct public electronic meetings without the quorum of the public body or any member of the governing board physically assembling at one location when the governor has declared a state of emergency and the nature of the declared emergency makes it impractical or unsafe for the board to assemble in person. The rationale behind this is that on April 22nd, 2020, the General Assembly adopted budget language that allowed local bodies to meet electronically to conduct normal business in light of the coronavirus pandemic. While this will help localities and school boards continue to conduct business in the short term, Virginia open meeting laws should come into alignment with modern technology and not require additional executive or general assembly action to allow local government, local governments to operate in the event that they are unable to meet during a state of emergency. Again, that was approved by the legislative position committee in a nine to zero vote. Any questions, comments? All right, well, I appreciate you all letting me go through that. Um, we will now move on to uh, section seven of our meeting, which is items for action. Uh, and uh, real quick, I will, I will run through it. Uh, it's revision to the following policies. Policies IFEA, planning for instruction, policy IGAH, Family Life Education, 
policy IKE, promotion and retention of secondary students, policy IJD, college and career readiness, policy IGE, adult education programs, and finally policy KQ, commercial, promotional, and corporate sponsorships and partnerships. Does anyone have any uh, comments about those or I will entertain a motion to approve them. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Samuels and a second, I believe from Dr. Mason. Yes. Uh, to approve uh, uh, the policies that I read, which is item 7.01 through 7.06 as a block. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Ms. Cherry? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Afonja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. The motion carries. All right. Our next uh, section is uh, section eight deliberation first read. And I believe all the policies on first read are uh, with Ms. Reeves, if that is correct. I will turn it over to her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, all of these policies are actually out of um, either section A, B, or C, which are all technically school board policies. Um, and some of these um, have some, some fairly minor updates. The first is um, policy AC on non-discrimination and what is being added so that um, it's going to be um, the same throughout all of our policies. Um, our specific characteristics that are protected by law, we're adding um, additional ones um, and they're being added to, have been added to other policies as well. So we're adding sexual orientation, gender identity, pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions and status as a veteran. Um, then we have um, the school board powers and duties, BBA, and um, uh, there's, there's some minor um, changes in language that we've been doing um, and VSBA has been doing throughout the policies and changing shall to will. Um, and in number 15, we're actually, um, adding to um, the division needing to identify shortages, not only of teachers, but of school bus drivers. Um, then we have um, school board policy BBBC, which is the student representative to the school board. And at the request of board members, um, this policy uh, um, and the qualifications for the student representative are being changed so that um, there'll be two equal student representatives. And um, the key thing is a representative who was a junior may apply to serve again in a subsequent year. And that's how that's been changed. So there's no longer under this new um, policy language going to be um, a rep and an alternate. There would just be two representatives. Um, and then we have um, two mirror policies, um, conflicts of interest, BBFA and GBACB. And principally what's changed here are some references to the Virginia code um, and, and the language that, that follows that. Um, we also have electronic participation in meetings from remote locations something that you just um, actually read about with regard to a VSBA um, position. And what is being recommended at this juncture is to, um, in addition to some, some changes um, referencing the Virginia code, is to add the language, um, uh, except as provided hereafter in all, all the rest of the policy, or as otherwise permitted by law, the school board does not conduct any meeting um, remotely. And so the in this case, by adding as otherwise permitted by law, that clearly encompasses things like the governor's executive order that we're under for COVID. 
Um, then we have um, CBA qualifications and duties of the superintendent and um, really um, only two changes, um, some additions, um, uh, some additional references to the Virginia code. And um, also um, there's an addition for um, the duties of the superintendent um, that it, it adds that he's going to be um, responsible upon the request of the board to survey the division um, about critical shortages of teachers and bus drivers. And then finally, we have reporting acts of violence and substance abuse um, policy CLA, and that's simply changing some language um, with regard to when an administrator um, needs to um, report um, th that a student has been involved in any of the um, enumerated um, conducts. And um, they're eliminating um, language such as, which may constitute a criminal offense, primarily because you know, one of them, for instance, uh, references um, conduct involving marijuana. And as you now know, um, under some circumstances, that's no longer gonna be considered a criminal offense, but it's gonna be a civil fine. So that language needs to be changed. Anybody need any clarifications on any of Very much, Ms. Rees. Do we have any questions for clarification of these first three policies? All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Reeves, again. All right, uh, we now move on to the uh, informational section of our meeting. Well, I do want to announce our next meeting will be uh, Wednesday, November 4th uh, at Jones Magnet Middle School at 6.30 p.m. Uh, that is at 1819 Nickerson Boulevard. Uh, and then in lieu of our work session meeting, which is typically the third Wednesday of the month, uh, we will be doing our first ever virtual community priorities workshop uh, that will be held November 12th, which is a Thursday. Um, and the Zoom session opens up at 545 and the workshop or the, the meeting, the event will start at 6 p.m. So uh, first I will uh, ask Dr. Smith if he has any informational items. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No further business from the superintendent. All right, thank you. Do we have any informational item from board members? All right. Well, thank you all very much for, for hanging in there this evening. Uh, it was great to see all of you and, and thank everyone for uh, joining this evening and watching this, this very important meeting. And without further ado, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.